Jo no conec cap país que tingui la tradició pastissera que tenim a Catalunya. Entre panellets, pastís de Sant Jordi, crema catalana, torrons, coca de Sant Joan, tortell de reis... Pràcticament cada mes tenim algun producte que serveix per celebrar aquell dia. Welcome to Barcelona! La pastisseria a Catalunya moltes vegades o quasi sempre va lligada amb celebracions religioses. Vinga, molt bé. Anem a fer crema catalana o crema de Sant Josep. Per una banda tenim llet, per l'altra banda tenim nata líquida, sucre. Ho aromatitzarem tot plegat amb vainilla, canela amb, amb branca, pell de llimona, tenim maicena, rovells d'ous... Ja veureu que tot això és superfàcil. Llavors tenim aquí la llet i li posem els aromes. La vaina de vainilla sempre oberta per la meitat. Aquí dins, com ja tots sabeu, aquí és on està... Això és el caviar de la pastisseria. Una mica, veieu, la pell de la llimona, jo ja la tinc preparada aquí. El sucre i la nata líquida. Ho portem tot plegat a bullició i un cop bull, ho aboquem aquí, tornar-ho a posar al foc i, mentrestant, el que faig és remenar els rovells amb la maicena. La crema catalana l'espessim a base de maicena. El que fem és, primer, una mica de llet calenta, perquè si no, corre el risc que se'ns quallin les, els rovells. La barreja total. Es diu crema de Sant Josep perquè tradicionalment era quan es menjava la, la crema. Sobretot això va començar la tradició a menjar-se en les masies. I em diràs per què? Doncs perquè Sant Josep, que cau al mig de la primavera o als inicis de la primavera, és quan les gallines ponen més ous. Llavors hi havia una necessitat de gastar ous. I com heu pogut veure dins de la recepta de la crema, se'n gasta bastant d'això. Vale, ja tindríem la crema, ja està. La poso a la cassola de fang. Crema catalana, t'ho puc assegurar que és el postre més conegut internacionalment que tenim a la nostra cultura. I quan es fon la nata és bestial. O sigui, això a la boca, les textures, les temperatures... És, és impressionant. Mira, els llibres que més m'han influenciat des que vaig començar l'ofici de pastisser són els llibres de l'Antoni Miralda. L'Antoni Miralda jo crec que és dels grans artistes de la cultura catalana. O sigui, aquí sí que hi ha font d'inspiració. Bon dia, good afternoon. Welcome to another segment of the literature of the Mediterranean diet. During our week-long celebration of San Jordi, New York City 2021, organized and supported by the Farragut Fund for Catalan Culture in the U.S. and its director, Mary Ann Newman. My name is Rosie Song and I hold a chair in Hispanic Studies at, the, at Durham University in the U.K and author of A Taste of Barcelona, The History of Catalan Cooking and Eating with Ana Riera. And I'm very honored to share today's program with Peter Bush, whose work as translator of Catalan and Spanish, among other languages, uh, into English has been recognized and praised widely. He has recently translated a collection of essays uh, by renowned Catalan writer and essayist, Josep Pla, salt water, which we will be talking about today. To help us talk about Pla and the translation work done by Peter, I'm also very honored and pleased to welcome Dr. Margarida Mita, as she's known to friends, mm -hmm. Casa Cuberta y Rocarols, who teaches contemporary Catalan literature at the Universidad de Girona. Dr. Casa Cuberta received her PhD in Catalan philology by the Autonomous University of Barcelona 
and is a specialist on Catalan narrative at the turn of the 19th century and 20th century and his relationship with Modernisma, the Catalan avant-garde movement. She has written extensively on Santiago Rusignol and about the Catalan poetry contest from the early 20th, uh, 20th century, the Jocs Florals. And she has also written about Catalan landscape and its connection to literature. So I can't think of a better interlocutor for Peter to talk about Josep Pla's essays on the Catalan coast. She has also worked as translator herself and has translated Emile Zola, Georges Pes and Irene Nemirovsky into Catalan. And Peter Bush, uh, who will be again introduced later, is an award-winning translator who is currently residing in Oxford. His list of works are too long to mention them all here today, but we should highlight his much praised and award-winning translation of Josep Blas, The Great Notebook from 2014. Among other Catalan writers he has translated into English are Emily Teixidó, Najat El Hachmi, and Victor Catala. So welcome Mita and Peter, benvinguda y benvingut. Um, hello. 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 Thank you so much. Yes, and I'm going to ask uh, Mita actually to continue to introduce Peter and start us off with our conversation on Pla and salt water. And here's the book. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Marian Newman and Rosie Song for the opportunity to take part in this New York St. Jordi's Day 2021. And thanks to technology, it's now become a worldwide event. And above all, I'm very pleased to do so with Peter Bush, one of the most renowned translators of contemporary Catalan narrative into English. After a long career that includes the translation of one of the great monuments of Catalan literature of all time, El Quadern Gris, The Grey Notebook by Josep Pla, Peter Bush has just published his latest translation, Soul Water, also by Josep Pla uh, in Archipelago Books a monographic collection of texts, short stories, most of them from the second volume of Pla's complete work, conceived as vast memoir that seek to offer from an autobiographical point of view, an imago mundi, an image of the world. On a St. Jordi's Day, dedicated, among other things, to the Mediterranean culture and especially to gastronomy, the famous Mediterranean diet, the text that Pla dedicates uh, to the sea, fishermen and fish could not be missing. But it must be said that San Jordi is a festival in Catalonia in which literature takes center stage. And here, apart from the marine succulents evoked by Josep Pla, we are interested in talking about the way the writer presents these succulents to us through words. And no one better than Peter Bush, who has faced a major challenge for any translator, is here to talk about it. So Peter, what image of the world does Joseph Pla, who writes, retrieves, rewrites, and finally publishes the text of Saltwater Water in 1966, offer to the reader? Reading it? I feel a lot of melancholy and nostalgia for a lost world. Am I right in feeling this way? Um, <clears throat> well, thank you, Rosie and Misa, for your kind introduction. And I'd also like to thank Jules Schoolman at Archipelago Books, who is the publisher of uh, Salt Water and Life and Bitters. Um, when I think of the uh, when I think of salt water, I can't, uh, and Pla's idea that his writing is an image of the world, I can't separate that from my reading and translation of The Grey Notebook and Life and Visits, because I, I, I see the three books as three kind of key, key, key stages in his life, really. Um, although they were 
Grey Notebook, for instance, is the book of the writer who is the young writer who is making himself as a writer, wondering whether he's going to uh, be able to do it. Um, and in in that diary, he, he he kind of relates his early life on the on the Costa Brava and as a university student in Barcelona. And in in, in a sense, it's it's a, it's it's a very um, um, optimistic work in the sense that his life is all before him. And at the end, um, when he finishes at the university, he's going to go off as a journalist to Paris and uh, start an exciting life in the, in the 1920s when he's, uh, he'll be in Germany, he'll be in Italy, he'll go to Russia. He's all over the place um, as, a, as a correspondent, uh, writing uh, amazing kind of dispatches about um, the tremendous political turbulence in Europe at, at that time. So for instance, he covers the, um, he's in Russia in, 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 in 1925 and writes a, a sequence of articles which become a book and a bestseller in, 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 in Catalonia. Um, he writes for a year from Germany at the height of the hyperinflation um, and describes the, right, the rise of the extreme right of, of, of Hitler, but also the kind of daily lives of people who don't know what their money is going to be worth from nine o'clock in the morning and uh, uh, it's going to change at midday. Um, and then so he's, in, he's in Italy with the rise and covering the rise of Mussolini. Um, and then you come to salt water and it's as if the world has come to an end, not come to an end, but has kind of slowed down and almost come to a stop. Um, everything is very still, very slow. Um, as he says in the, at, at, at the beginning of uh, <coughs> a still life with, with, with fish, you know, what, what predominates, predominates is lethargy, living with a world where nothing is, is, is in a world where nothing is is really happening, but he says that that's a relief because he doesn't have to he doesn't have to worry about work, he doesn't have to worry about hunger, um, and he doesn't have to worry about kind of rapid activity. So that um, I see the salt water as a reflection of, uh, of Pla's experience in the 1940s, really, um, when he was in this kind of uh, in, inner exile, living along the Costa Brava in Fornells, in Caracas, in, 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 in La Scala, which were all um, centers for uh, fishing in, 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 in small, in, in, in small ways. And um, he's recording a world which he feels is slipping away because he knows that on the horizon is mass tourism. He knows that that co coast is not going to remain as it is then. But at the same time, he's writing that when people are uh, living very precariously, um, when they've just come through a civil war that has left the country devastated under a dictatorship that is actually denying the right to, to, to write in Catalan or even speak in Catalan in, in the streets. Um, and I think that um, the image of the world is in, 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 in salt water is of um, the beauty within that melancholy st stillness and lethargy. For instance, the, the landscapes around Caracas, the, the town of Caracas itself are, 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 de are described in very sensuously. Um, the, the sea is described um, 
in with, with kind of the, the, the kind of seascapes of in every in every story or, or, or every chronicle. But at the same time, he is um, in conversation with people. And I think this is throughout in the three books that I've translated, uh, written by Platt, one of the remarkable um, aspects of, of Platt as a writer is his ability to, re to relate to all kinds of people and, and to recreate the, the, those conversations so that really it's an image of the world, it's an image of the physical material world where people live, but it's also an image of the world of individuals brought to life through uh, through convers through conversation. Um, so uh, I'm um, particularly struck by the um, by the conversations with with uh, for instance the the fisherman Hermos, um, who was a, a great friend of Plas. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also the, the an, an, a fisherman who kind of leaves the the, the small town where he is and, and, and goes to live in an isolated spot in, in Aigua Blava um, because he wants to kind of be free. He doesn't want to be he, even the, the kind of minimal um, social life uh, that there is in, 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 does he come from Bagua? I can't remember at the moment, but that's too much for him. He wants to get away from that just to be with his boat, the sea, the sand, and, and his activities as a fisherman. But at the same time, there are a lot of the, a lot of the chronicles are devoted to the work, the industry of the sea, and the dangers of the sea. Um, but there, there, there are three, three or four narratives that are shipwrecks along the Costa Brava, and um, Pla is, is 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 very good at digging out these 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 narratives and describing historical shipwrecks, but also shipwrecks in the in the in in the present. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a lot of humour in in salt water. Um, for instance, the, there's the young uh, Frenchman, the tourist, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they have a, a boat and they go with his mates, they have a summer holiday in the, on, the, on the Mediterranean and everything is going to be wonderful. But of course, they know nothing about the local um, climate, the way that storms can suddenly appear from, from nowhere and they, and they end up losing their boat. And he's in conversation with an old sea salt called uh, Joseph Joubert, who is very kind of ironic or sarcastic to this young French lad who is obviously, you know, kind of got lots of money, whereas Joubert, who's had a hard life as a sailor, is now reduced to um, a, a pretty poverty-stricken life and eking out an existence as a, as a kind of administrative assistant in the town hall. Um, so is, salt water is... Um, if you like, it's a, it's a, it's an epic, uh, an epic description of life on the Costa Brava, but it's an epic in an, a, a situation that is not epic. It, it's it's it, it's as I said, it's that stillness, that lack of activity, almost um, often futility. Uh, many of the stories really nothing. That what what they set out to do is either going nowhere or doesn't happen. For instance, um, Miner in one from Bagur, you know, he's a fisherman who loses a hand because he likes to fish using explosives. And one day he doesn't handle it properly, so he loses a hand. Um, and he's contracted by Germans dur the, during the First World War to act as a, as a, as a guide as, as, as on a submarine hoping to take out um, a con some of the convoy of ships that are coming through the Mediterranean. And, um, you know, Miner, who takes on that um, job, um, he's horrified by life in the submarine. The, the, the way that the fumes, everything is, is contaminated by the, the, the scent, the, the oil and the, the the, the machine, the metal, the life of the machine and the metal. Um, and, and he finds that 
really loathsome. Um, but then what happens? Um, finally, the, con the convoy that they hoped to, 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 to bomb, to torpedo, um, gets, goes through because it's, it's too well guarded. And then a separate boat comes along and it's full of horses. And so the final image of that story is this boat going down with hundreds of horses neighing and fighting to get out of the boat um, before, before it, before it um, goes down. Um, well, there's the smuggling story where he goes on. Um, I mean, we talk about, I mean, he as Josette Platt, because it, almost, it always seems as if the narrator is Josette Platt. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't say that that is, is Josette Platt. It's, it's him as the narrator. It's a fictitious Josette Platt, if you like. Um, no doubt a lot of what is there is, is based on Platt's experience, but it is within the context of a fiction. Um, but in the smuggling story, the, the, you know, he goes on the boat and goes along the coast uh, to France and then nothing happens. They, they, they can't collect what they've gone to collect. So they have to go back all, all the way and it's been a futile, futile experience. Or, or when he goes, he, a friend of his, Mascarel, has a boat. He's a kind of wealthy man who buys a boat, thinks it would be great to go out to sea. And they, they set out from Mallorca to go to Barcelona. Um, and everything is wonderful, and, and this and this guy has a, even has a library on his boat, and they're talking about Goethe and Goethe's ideas when he first saw the sea. Um, um, but then again, a storm comes up; it, it, they almost, you know, the, the, they the, they almost lose the ship, but they end up having to go back where they came from to, and 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 Mascarel leaves his boat there and never never returns to, to that boat again. So there's a sense of a series of activities that are, um, if you like, well, they are almost futile. If you compare it to a life in bitters where the, where the, the plan, the, the narrator in life in bitters is a journalist who is reporting on key moments in European history in salt water Plan, the fictional narrator, is he's recording a, a different kind of life, which is the the life of those people, of himself, along the Costa Brava, in that po in that kind of deadly post-war situation. Don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's really really interesting. Um, well, uh, some of these texts, Plasés were written during the, uh, his youth, others after the Spanish Civil War, when the writer settled in a kind of inner exile, you said, in the Empurda. Uh, constant of this text is food. Yeah. In the 1950s, when he recovered a few for his complete works project for the Biblioteca Selecta, post-war famine was still very much present um, is this insistence of food deliberate in that sense? It's a very interesting question because I I had never th um, thought of that really as the, the 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 descriptions of the food might be in a way provocative um, because obviously if you're reading a, you know if you're reading those stories and you're in Bar in Barcelona or if you're in Madrid then they. Uh, they're going to be provocative because you're finding it hard to get bread, let, let alone sardines and all these wonderful fish <laughs> that, he <laughs> meant, that he mentions. Um, um, so, or, or was it that Plath thought that reading, you know, reading a, the, these descriptions of these wonderful uh, meals and the ways that you can cook sardines or group of fish or, or octopus or lobster um, would be like a, a kind of compensation for people. They could imagine what it was like to, <laughs> to eat these things when it was possible to eat these things. Maybe that, that is part of the part, part of Plas project. Another, another aspect to this, of course, is that um, 
the in the years of hunger the hunger is relative relative often to where you actually happen to live mm. if you're living on the costa brava in, in one of these fishing uh, villages then it's or, or in one of the inland um, agricultural towns it's unlikely that you're as hungry as you would be if you were living in the middle of andalusia or extremadura because the fish is there in the sea. You can grow things on the land. Um, so that it, it, it kind of, I think the, the fact that the, the, those sardines keep coming up in, um, and gleaming uh, in the pan with the, with the bottle of white wine, um, I mean, it was a reflection of a reality that existed along the Costa Brava. The, I mean, people still ate fish still ate chickens um, these things were it was less difficult along along the Costa Brava I think for for most people um, I mean I myself come from a, a rural town in Lincolnshire in the UK and um, during the Second World War you know there, were, there was rationing in the UK and some of my some of my uncles were were small farmers and they made loads of money on the black market and uh, you know, they, they, they were never short of a chicken or two. Um, so, it, you know, as I said, it, it, the years of the hunger was relative to where you, where you were located, I think, often. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, um, I mean, I well, think that he does, I mean, sorry. if you think about the people that he's talking to, they're all active as fishermen, aren't they? Um, or fish, or like the fishwife. There's the fishwife in the um, in uh, <coughs> the story of Hermos. Um, Lydia, do you remember her from Cadaqués, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who falls in love with Eugenie Ors? Ors. Um, Lydia and She thinks that she's la la ben plantada, um, <laughs> and and comes to a horrible end. But I mean, in a you know, kind of in her uh, best days. She was a fantastic cook, and she, she and her husband, you know, um, she had, she was somebody who sold fish and had the best fish that there was to 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 to, to buy. Um, but there are, there is a mention in, in the in the story, another interest. I mean, the story where f food um, doesn't figure so much, which is bread and grapes. Mm -hmm. the, the story of his relationship with with the, with the smuggler bread and grapes and a, and, a, and a kind of feud between two smugglers and two smuggling gangs for control of that coast um, which was very I mean smuggling was obviously a key part of the economy of the Costa Brava in those years which was a reflection of the post-war setup um, the there's a mention of la, la Cruilla which is that path that goes from Rosas to mm. um, to Cadaqués, and he walks along that with 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 bread and grapes to and to talk about what they have to talk about in in terms of the uh, of the of the plot of that story. Um, but but he says that most people who go along that path are the Rosas poor, the mainly women, who have to kind of hump large um, baskets of food or whatever on their heads through the mountains to Cadaqués in order to in, in order to, to to make a living um, and I think there are, there are kind of small details like that that Pla puts in which indicate um, that there was another side there were the, there were the fishermen and if you had a boat you were relatively wealthy but then there were the people who didn't have um, boats and had to um, live on at a different level which you I mean, he, 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 he in, a, in a small paragraph, he describes how these women, you know, they leave all their energy, all their nerves and all their lives on that track through the mountains. Um, Perhaps, Mita, since uh, we are talking about these essays, we can, um, and you actually, in our conversations, we talked about what a literary challenge it was to actually uh, translate this poetic the quality of Giuseppe Bla. So perhaps we can move on to the reading a little bit of the text. Oh, perfect. Yeah. 
Um, well, um, we can uh, or we shall uh, read a couple of excerpts uh, of Still Life with Fish in English and in Catalan. Um, uh, can I start? Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things that you said actually was sort of this um, insig insignificant writing that exactly that seems to engage with yet is has such poetic quality. Exactly. And I think that one of the essays that Peter was referring to is Still Life with it's Fish. Exactly. So we actually, among the three of us, had talked about how wonderful it would be to just sort of hear that difference between Catalan and English. So do you want to read a little bit in Catalan, Mita? And Peter, can you read from your translation? Uh, Perfect. And think a little bit about uh, these, these words. Um, and I know, Mita, you had some uh, insight about Peter's uh, translation quality, if you want to yes, share. Yes, of that. course. Uh, I'm really, really um, excited with the poem uh, about uh, different types of fish uh, in the same still life uh, with fish. And I think that uh, it, this is a must. Uh, this is a must uh, in translation. In translation. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly well translated, and it's so it sounds like music. And I think more than in the original version in Catalan, I regret to say. And if you want, uh, I can read uh, first of all this poem. Uh, what do you think? Sure. In Catalan. Okay. So. La carnosa palomida, el molt lletós i suau, i la premsada palaia amb el congre tornejat, la ramadora rellagosta i el brau cranc amb la sípia tinturera i l'ossorell argentat, la pigatosa morena, el pagell sobredorat amb el llagostí de nàcar, la, molla, la mollera de cristall, des de la més fresca llissa, el llop més sec i salat. Fleshy pompano, tender milky mallet and compact soul, with sinuous conger eel, rowing lobster, goliath crab, inky squid and silvery scad. Freckled moray, gilded bream, with mother of pearl, langoustine, and glassy corbo, from freshest mullet to driest, saltiest pass. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> it's fantastic. That is so lovely. Um, Peter, do you want to read us a little bit of uh, the description of the fish? The dusty um, grouper. Yeah, the grouper. Let's hear a little bit about that. Uh -huh. um, and now we can close this uh, wonderful segment. Yes. <laughs> the dusky grouper is the best fish in the Ampurdan. The first time I saw one swimming in the waters around Cape Bagur, I was fascinated by its shape and power. It has a huge head, a muscular body and dark skin covered in yellow blotches. It swept across the limpid water like a phosphorescent flash of lightning as if the friction from its viscous form had created a beam of light in the luminous water. Dusky groupers can be caught on a long line hook or with a line with bait trailed strategically in front, in front of their lairs, because it is worth noting, those groupers always live in hollows and caverns along the coast. The depth of their lairs varies constantly. They can be very deep, but are often very shallow, three or four yards down and little more. That's why on days when the water is clear, it is relatively easy to contemplate the fascinating spectacle of a group of swimming. They are difficult to land if they're not hunted with a creel because they are so strong. 
when they sense they've been hooked, their first reaction is to enter their lair or to squeeze into a crack in the rock. In such cases, the danger is that the line hooking them will be severed as it chafers against a rocky ridge. When you feel that first powerful tug on your hand, you must land it quickly if you were to stymie the fish's stratagem. There is a complete division of opinion about the best way to prepare a dusky grouping. Fortunately, fortunately, it is excellent, however it is cooked. Some reckon the best rice in the world is that cooked with a grouper's head. I'm also of that opinion. A grouper's head and a handful of rice is a thing of beauty. Others prefer it stewed. In any case, it is such a meaty, tasty fish, it can't be bettered, fried. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> On that note, uh, and I think it's close to lunch time, not for Mita, who has to wait a couple of hours, but perhaps for Peter and me uh, in the UK time, we're about lunch, right, Peter? That's it's right. It's on your lunch <laughs> today. <laughs> I must say that when I translated, the, in all the drafts, whenever I translated, at the end of my session in the morning, I always felt very hungry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's great. How about yeah. you, Mita? Are you going to have fish for lunch today? No, I, I, I don't think so. Not, to, not today. <laughs> I think a sandwich today is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mita, can you give us a final few words about salt water and Peter's translation and actually Giuseppe Blas plays in Catalan literature and culture as we close down this segment. Well, I think uh, these uh, translations from Peter Bush are great, magnificent. Um, uh, Giuseppe Blas is one of the um, most fantastic writers in Catalonia. Uh, and also, uh, I think we have, uh, we are really lucky to have one of these writers, the best writers, I think, in the world, in fact. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much to both of you. Happy San Jordi. And Happy San Jordi. Happy San Jordi. Happy for the next instance of San Jordi, perhaps in Barcelona, perhaps by the coast, perhaps sharing a few grilled sardines. I am indeed hungry with the, you know, and, and, and hoping for some of the gloomy sardines. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Adieu. Bye. The summer of 1929 was a season of phosphorescence. The most lacquered chassis, the most pearlescent yachts festooned with the most profuse bunting, combined to dazzle all the bootblacks from Almeria who bent to their trade at the foot of La Rambla, around the monument to Columbus, and on the sidewalk cafes of the Plaza de Catalunya. Cabarets once again exuded chill champagne, as in the good old days of World War I. Barcelona's hotels were overwhelmed. Anyone with an extra cot or a room ordinarily devoted to fleas had a cannon from Extremadura or a fishmonger from Porvo as a boarder. Some even went so far as to lay mattresses on the rooftops and use the lightning rods for hangers. Barcelona was bubbling in a stew of grandeur and it was every man for himself, eyes, Cheeks, noses, and sexes found infinite room to play. Nocturnal parties during the exhibition were truly a dream, a prodigious sight that horrified the people of Barcelona. Dinners at Ambassadors, La Rosaleda, Miramar, and their more economical versions at the Hostal del Sol and La Pérgola, together with the wine and roasted almonds from the Patio del Farolillo, served to expand the gastronomic unconsciousness of the country. Anyone with five duros, or even without them, went to Montjuic to see the exposition. At closing time, the Ramblas and the cabarets were packed to the gills. At the end of the day, 
the American fleet would spew out a stream of giant toy sailors dressed like children who would gorge themselves on sweet sherry and the high octane alcohol known as Aiguarden, later, later toppling onto benches or carrying women around on piggyback. Then, a squad of some kind of officers, spiffy and loose-limbed as a Charleston, would beat them down with billy clubs and pile them into a big old wagon. When they reached the Porta de la Pau, they would toss them into the lounges, and the sailors would tumble in with a plop like bales of wet cotton. Hello, my name is Laura McLaughlin, and I'm a literary translator, primarily from Catalan into English. And one of my very first translations was this book, um, Pedra de Tartera by Maria Barbal. Maria Barbal is the grand dame of Catalan literature. Uh, she was born in 1949 in Tremp and studied philology in Barcelona, where she still lives today. Um, since publishing her breakthrough novel, Pedra de Tartera, in 1985, she has established herself as the most influential and successful um, Catalan contemporary writer. And her work has been published in 17 languages. Uh, she's won numerous awards. Most recently, the Premier Josep Pla for her, her book Tandem. And she's just been awarded the Honorary Prize of Catalan Literature, um, a kind of Catalan Nobel Prize for Literature. And as I said, uh, I translated Maria's early novel. And as I mentioned, this is it, A uh, Stone on a Landslide. And the, the novel is set in the early 20th century when 13-year-old Concha um, has to leave her home village in the Pyrenees uh, to work for her childless aunt. After years of hard labour, uh, she finds love with Jaume, um, but this love will be thwarted by the Spanish Civil War. And approaching her own death, Concha looks back on her life, um, a life in which she's lost everything except her own indomitable spirit. And I'd like to read um, a short extract. The meadow I liked best was Tres Aigos, where three streams met. On one side ran the Arlet, bathing the meadow before it left its deposit in the river. Its lower boundary was marked by the Orri itself, and along the top of the was the irrigation channel from the Torna Spring. The grass there grew good and tall, and it was the only place you could harvest three times, the first as usual, but then twice more after reaping. It wasn't a very large meadow, and while we worked, we could see each other. For me, this was one of its charms, because in the two Costa Barada meadows, you could look up and find that suddenly you were all alone. I knew that the others were behind the slope with a row of hazel trees, but a feeling of being completely alone would grip me, and I'd start to remember the hundreds of terrifying stories I'd heard about vipers and all kinds of snakes. I could hardly work because I was afraid of what I might find in the grass I was turning. If it weren't for the thought of uncle making fun of me, I'd have gone to find the barrel and have some water. I was completely alert as I raked and didn't miss even the smallest movement in the grass. It was only when I caught sight of Tia's dark scarf that I felt safe again. We'd spent the afternoon turning the grass in Tres Aguas. It was getting dark and the breeze made a restless sound through the, through the nearby hazel trees. I heard Uncle's whistle and I, and I picked up my rake and pitchfork. I was hot under my headscarf and felt the sweat burning the roots of my hair. When I took the scarf off, I heard all sorts of sounds, above all the noise of the flies. I ran to the cart as fast as I could, but waited for Tia before I got in as she had, had stayed to close the gate. While I stood there, I looked at the land divided up into small irregular plots. I thought, 
Even the richest man here is still very poor. The plots gave at most four cartloads of hay. The mule seemed to be looking at me with his peaceful gaze, and I rubbed his nose with my hand. The bell tower appeared, stretching its neck over the houses of Payars. As we went down towards home, the stones made the wheels bounce so much we nearly fell out. Hello, I'm Mara Faye Lethem, and I'm here on behalf of Omnium Cultural, wishing everyone a very happy San Jordi, uh, International World Book Day. And I am on this time to talk about a book that I translated called Learning to Talk to Plants by Marta Oriols, um, which is available in English from Kushkin Press. And... Um, just came out recently I think coming to the States even more recently um, also with Pushkin the original of which is Apendra Parlam Las Plantas a winner of the Omnium Cultural Prize for Best Catalan Language Novel of the Year in 2019 which is why uh, they asked me to talk a little bit about it today and read a little bit from my translation so you can get a taste. Um, uh, Marta is a Catalan author. This is her first novel. She previously had a book of short stories. Her second novel is this, Dulce Introduccio al Caos, uh, which just came out even more recently. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know how much you know about San Jordi, but uh, she'll be signing here in Barcelona um, a copies of her book, because uh, this is our, a day where everyone gives a gift of a book or a rose or both, and so uh, the streets are lined with authors, and it's quite a, quite a lovely day. And so, it, learning to talk to plants, it's English language cousin. Um, eh, I'm going to read you some copy here to, to give you an idea before I start the reading. Paula's partner has died in a car accident, but no one knows her true grief. Only hours before his death, Mauro revealed that he was leaving her for another woman. Paula guards this secret and plows on with her job as a pediatrician in Barcelona trying to maintain the outline of their old life. But all of Mauro's plants are dying. The fridge only contains expired yogurt, and her mind feverishly obsesses over this other unknown woman. As the weeks pass, vitality returns to Paola in unexpected ways. She remembers slowly how to live and how to take care of the plants on the balcony. <laughs> um, it, if this sounds intriguing to you, um, check out the book. It's a, it's a special book, and um, Marta and I had a very special experience that I should shout out here. Um, we got to travel together before this whole pandemic to Art Oh My um, in the Catskills and work together on the last details of the translation, and it's a, a very... Uh, a very privileged experience um, to to be able to spend a few weeks with your author and, and ask all those questions that you uh, probably were too embarrassed to write in an email. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to read just the first bit of learning to talk to plants before we were alive. Terrorist attacks, accidents, wars, and epidemics weren't our concern. We could watch movies that made light of dying, others that turned the act of dying into an act of love. But we remained outside that zone where the true meaning of death resided. Some nights, protected by the arrogance of our late youth, we would lie in bed surrounded by huge soft pillows and we would watch the news in the dim light, our feet intertwined, and that was when death 
without us knowing, settled all bluish into the lenses of Mauro's glasses. 137 people died in Paris in attacks claimed by the Islamic State. Six deaths in less than 24 hours on the roads in three different head-on collisions. An overflowing river caused four deaths in a small town in southern Spain. At least 70 dead in a chain of attacks in Syria. And scared for a moment, we might have said things like, what a world, poor guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the news, if it wasn't too harsh, would dwindle that very night in the confines of the bedroom of a couple, a couple that was also fizzling out. We'd change the channel and watch the end of a movie. And meanwhile, I'd confirm his arrival time the next day or remind him to go past the dry cleaners to pick up his black coat. If we'd had a good day in those last months, we might make love, but matter-of-factly. If the news was momentous, its effects would last a little longer, be part of the conversation on a coffee break at work or in line at the fishmongers. But we were alive. Death was for others. So that's the very beginning of learning to talk to plants, the English version of Aprendera por la las plantas. Thank you to Omnium Cultural, to San Jordi in New York and all the uh, people behind it that make this happen. And of course to Pushkin Press. So if you like that reading, uh, look for the book. Hi, my name is Nate Adrian Nathan West. I'm going to read a short poem for you, a translation from the Catalan by Pere Jean Ferré. The poem in Catalan is called Parans, in English it's called Snares. It begins with a brief epigraph by Wallace Stevens, who had a great influence on Pera. He has an essay in which he describes him as sort of his um, cardinal poet, the poet that he looks to most. Um, that quote is, poetry is the subject of the poem. So, they say Apollinaire wrote, culling scraps of conversation, overheard in cafes in Montmartre, Cubist perspectives, like the clippings in the journal of Juan Gris, snares where the background is sharper than the sinisure, the foreground a bit disfigured, reduced to angles and spirals, the colors livelier in twilight windows, a clang in the cabin of childhood. Helderlin talked of that, and they were chambers, preceptor, red damask, Venetian mirror, wo zu dichte in dürftige Zeit, and Goethe would write Schiller that his young friend, though still a bit timid and naturally wanting in experience, everything in that letter's tone makes manifest the older man's benevolent contempt for the poetry of the younger. He had already written verses, so it struck him, far serener or better, or if not of a classicism such as would vouchsafe his immortality, because classic art is imperishable. Helderlin, in his late years, wrote to his mother respectfully with turns of phrase he had learned as a boy, asking only for underwear, a pair of badly darned socks, small commonplace things, like Rambot in Abyssinia or at the sick house, que je suis donc devenu malheureux. And so poets end, injured, annulled, dead alive. And so we call them poets. And so, the crucifixion of a few is perhaps no more than a sign, and grandeur and death the equilibrium of others, and Yeats is phosphorescent, Byzantium like a gong at twilight, the price to be paid for him whose name was written water. Because a price must be paid, you can be sure of it. Eurydice still lies dead over the circuits in the blue of a room tepid like the carcass of a mahogany piano. Orpheus's world is that of the mirror's backing, Orpheus's fall, like Eurydice's journey home from hell, the bicycles, the boys chewing gum on their way back from playing tennis, backs bronzed, bodies golden and fragile, the girls in red leggings with Adriatic blue eyes sipping gin and orange, the ones who swim nude in the novels of Pavese, and we dubbed them the Topolino girls. I'm not sure you know the Topolino. It was a car fashionable, or maybe just often to be seen in the roaring 40s. But I'm older now, even if old is not quite the right word, but the color of gin and orange, 
Où sont, où sont the dreams that money can buy? Two. This poem is a succession of snares for the reader and proofreader and for the editor of the poem. To be clear, no one has told me what the snares conceal because that would be like telling me the figure in the carpet. And this, as Henry James has made clear, is not possible. So the poem, as you can see, is uh, in a number of languages. It's a little bit obscure. Um, you have, for example, a buried quote in there from Gottfried Ben. Uh, you have the mention of Rambaud. I don't think I'll do too much to illuminate it. In an interview, Pera says that he does not in the least strive for readers to grasp everything in the poem, but only that the poem have a certain poetic vigor. And I think that's good enough. Thanks. Esta no es mi tierra, quien sabe mi lugar. Por más que se extraño, hoy se siente un Hay quien dice que el corazón quiere anidar. Tanto 
R de rondalla de la matança. En un poblet de les muntanyes, a les escorrialles espirituals d'Europa, cada hivern s'hi fa la matança quan el fred ve i tot ho tomba. És un poblet ben a la seva, se senten de allà dalt la gent, ni de Porto, ni de Ginebra, ni de Madrid o del Conflent. Ni saben quins temes es tracten al Parlament Europeu, els cau molt lluny la bandanga aquella sense cap ni peus. No saben que hi campa l'ultradreta, no saben que el Brexit hi topa, no saben que ni que ho sabessin no hi podrien fer res. Governs i pobles, desaparellats com mitjons, són l'Europa d'ara, sempre a contrapeu i a remolc dels desastres, el desgavell. Però de la tele no se n'escapen. Al vespre, després d'ensurfatar i tancar les bèsties, rematen la jornada des del sofà i miren qualsevol dels programes, si fa no fa, són tots iguals, a cada canal s'escridassen i el Cristo és descomunal. No fan gaire cas els estels. La Terra i l'univers els tracten de tu a tu, no es miren al cel embadalits perquè no els fa falta. Quina pretensió creure que la Terra era el centre de tot plegat. Com ara, és de carallots pensar que només el nostre planeta tot té sentit i sensibilitat, que la resta és un cosmos absurd, immens i buit. Al poble són quatre gats ben avinguts, tres mafiosos, vuit mestresses, uns quants ballets i els nouvinguts, els de Barcelona, sense esma de tornar el diumenge a ciutat, res en secretament que nevi i el poblet quedi ben colgat. Botifarra negra a la brasa, i vi de la vinya del costat, un arròs amb el que culls de l'hort, un grapat de mongetes, alls tendres i mig conill i un tall de cansalada que et regala el pagès amic, un ancià mai tocat per aigua, meravella només igualada per peix mai no tocat pel gel, el foc que s'enfila com un dimoni i escalfa la caseta en flat vida. Allà dalt tot són luxes. Però no passa. L'alemany Estefi ja és una més amb tanta empenta com els ancestres vilatans, ella ha aixecat tota soleta, corral, hivernacle i tres infants. Diuen que són fills del pastor, en Josep, un noi molt trempat. Potser sí o potser no. L'Estefi i anar-hi anant. Ara acull d'Alemanya dos minyons dels que en diuen problemàtics. Els cuida i s'amanceixen. Fa miracles. A Balneari, l'aire dels cims. Obliden penes i, amb treballs, també les pantalles se'ls desenganxen dels dits. Com els traumes i els abusos que havien patit de petits. Tresquen amb el ramat per prats i comes, s'empaiten i s'abandonen. L'Agustina i en Marcelino, institució viva del poble, els conviden a la piscina i és permanent el bateig en l'alegria, els xipollets d'una altra vida possible. Però si poden s'escapen. Pugen a Berlín fent dit. Quin sideral. Voten de tot. Pugen pels descosits, roben, dormen al carrer... Fins que tornen. Al poblet també hi ha un poeta. El cervell li va a mil per hora. Té terra als versos i mai frena. Enfonya síl·labes com qui planta trumfes i li surten poemes que han caçat mots entre les arrels, per uagues i avencs. Paraules com... Grapal, Cardigal, Acaliu. La llengua a la punta dels dits i els ulls inquiets salten del llibre Kill all the normies, el paisatge, del cor quiet el món magastre, del carnet tot rible que vibra, els fatxes que es posen de moda per tot i tothom els fa nosa. Amb el llapis pren quatre notes del que li dicten les abelles brunzidores, fan de l'om núvol sorollós i de l'home boixi encanteri. Els lladrucs, els tractors, la serra elèctrica, els escallots, la piuladissa, els crits de la mainada veïna... Diuen que aquí, si t'hi fixes bé, pots arribar a sentir com neix el vent. Tot li entra per la porta oberta del poema. Perquè sí, això no està escrit en prosa. Sí, així també es pot pensar, comptant síl·labes, fent rimar, deixant que passi el que no toca. Sí, això és un poema rimat, vist que el rebla i jugar amb la llengua, vist que el vers entortolligat i rumiar rebregant la llengua. Si aquest poema es tradueix, vist que l'esforç del traductor, benvingut el que hi afegeix perquè els versos tinguin color, perquè s'hi trobi un nou sentit, que l'escriptura es multipliqui, que hi fiqui l'atzar cullerada, que es defugi el pensament típic, que el nou poema sigui casa nova, que d'aquests versos surtin fruits estranys, verins, malmelades d'àvies rares, que en piqui pugui de llengua empeltada, escampada, alliberada i renascuda. Si hem de pertanyar a una cultura que sigui un mar de llengües i afectes diferents, 
fora malures de puresa i vides perfectes. El poeta no ve a la matança, però alguns arriben el dia abans. L'endemà, quan és fosca encara i la son impedeix el gall cantar, el poblet encén llums i posa la cafetera al foc. Desperta qui fa el ronso, lleganyes fora, tres bots i cap a la nit freda, seguint el rastre del propi baf. Una premonició umbilical com la de Toni Darko s'encaminen a ca l'Estefi. És tradició que ve de lluny matar el porc plegats a la plaça. Fa 500 anys que es fa en públic, des de la reconquesta, des de l'expulsió dels jueus, per demostrar qui és cristià vell. El porc que s'agrega, el porc frontera animal, el porc com a humiliació que té de morcilla, el porc nostre santificat a cada plat. Des de llavors, abans no. Abans era una carn més, sense significat, no era símbol, només bèstia. També per comprovar les habilitats i les pors dels nouvinguts de la família, qui s'arronsa al netejar els budells, qui saliva amb el perol bullent, qui s'esgarrifa amb els esguells, qui lliga sobrassada amb les dents. A Amèrica no hi havia porcs. Des de la Gomera, en 1493, Cristòfol Colom va adornar buit. Van menjar-se llengardaixos, pinyes, mandioca, nous i ocells, van multiplicar-se ràpidíssim i amb la grip que covaven van matar un milió i mig d'indis. L'Estefi té la curador a la mà. L'Estefi sap molt bé com fer-s'ho. Quan llança el poble i els barons, ara comanda la matança i endreça tothom a les seves tasques. El porc resisteix, s'ho veu a venir. L'han agafat fort entre sis, la curador no falla el tall. La sang borbolleja directe a la galleda negra, a doll. Li passa el bufador per tot, la pell cremada omple el garatge de ferum de socarrim bestial. De seguida es comença a escorxar. Tot mata el fred, ningú per aquí. Els petits al camp amb la mànega buiden la tripa, a dins els grans es pellen, tallen i separen, primer cap i peus i espinada, fora budells, el cor i el fetge, penjats a la pròpia mantellina, després filet, costellam, llom, espatlles i ventresca, del cap, galtes, orelles i morro, cuixes i espatlles desusades, es guarda el greix per l'embotit i per fer llarg. Aleshores, picar les carns, barrejar-les, de genollons amb les dues mans i fins que el cul sui, que deia en mesquí de llefra de tu. Salpabrar-les, espaciar-les, embotir-les, penjar-les i de pet a la taula parada, a celebrar les llobades. Després de la matança, se celebra la matança. Després de la matança, ningú pregunta què queda del porc. Tothom se tipa feliç. Després de la història, ningú pregunta què queda del món. Si viu, ja està. Després de la guerra, ningú pregunta què queda del país. Es malda per sobreviure. Després d'Europa, ningú pregunta què queda d'Europa. Tothom està distret. La resposta sempre serà tot i res. Tot s'aprofita i res no es perd. Tot canvia de forma i de nom. On no hi ha sang, no s'hi fan botifarres. La carn serà carn i la courem amb el propi greix. Ens fotrem un bon tiberi per celebrar el que sigui victòria o ensulciada, el que queda o el que hem perdut. Potser ens farem vegetarians. Potser acabaran les matances. Els porcs camparan lliures i deixaran de ser frontera. Potser Europa perdrà el seu nom, escorxada per passar l'hivern. Potser els sobreviurem amb l'embotit de la matança, amb la carn seca de l'esperança, amb el cos tirat endavant per equilibrar la balança de les penes passades i de les cultures marcides. Quan ens haurem polit el rebost, quan del passat no en quedin ni les engrunes, quan tota la nostra carn sigui memòria o quan la desmemòria ho destroni tot, quan un continent pugui tornar a ser només terra fèrtil, recer i possibilitat, podrem començar una nova rondalla. I'm Sebastian Faber. I'm professor of Hispanic studies at Oberlin College. Um, and I regularly write for the Spanish uh, media and in English for the nation with Becker Seguin about um, contemporary events, current events in Spain. And uh, I just published a book, Exhuming Franco, um, which kind of takes the exhumation of the former dictator a couple of years ago as a moment to reflect on what exactly might still be the legacies of Francoism in Spain today, 
And Franco died, as you know, in 1975, where 40 some years later, to what extent is the dictatorship still present in Spain and, and in what shape? Uh, it's, it's a quickly written book. It's meant for non-specialist, non-Spanish readers. Uh, but that really brings up the question of what it means to, to write about or to talk about Spain outside of Spain. What does it mean when non-Spaniards, um, experts or not, um, translate Spain for non-Spanish audiences and what can go wrong there and what can go right there. And so I'm very happy um, that Magda Bandera, who is interviewed in the book, the book itself contains a lot of interviews and Ignacio Salellas, uh, very happy that they can be here with me today to talk a little bit about these bigger issues that uh, the book brings up. Uh, thanks, Sebastian, first of all, for inviting me to, to discuss or to have a short conversation uh, about your recent book. Uh, I think it's an important, an important book, not only for non-Spaniards uh, readers, uh, we can then have a conversation on that. I'm a, currently a professor at Bryn Mawr College um, in Pennsylvania, and here in the United States as well. And I work also uh, contemporary Spain, maybe a more contemporary period. And that's why I'm always interested in, in this kind of dialogues with other temporalities that actually when we, when we work on the 70s is where we meet, right? <laughs> if you come from the, from the early 20th century and I come from, from the 21st one probably, right? Hi, I'm Magda Bandera. I'm a journalist from Barcelona. Now I'm working as editor-in-chief for uh, of La Marea. And I was listening to you and then I was thinking that the first person, um, the first dead person I saw was Franco. I was four years old and he appeared every time on TV. And uh, maybe that's the first question I remember uh, uh, I put that. I put the question to my parents. What does it mean? Because he looked like a fish in a in a in a tin or something like that. And I was uh, people were um, behaving very strange. So I think um, that had more uh, impact in my life than I thought uh, first. Uh, the first thing I, I would like to say or to state uh, um, about the book is that it shows the urgent need for for the academic world to rethink new epistemologies, right? Uh, I think you are in the position of doing other kind of books other than the peer review books, the, um, you know, this, this very old uh, fashion epistemology that we work with. And I think it's important what you do, uh, new ways of generating knowledge, right? And in different ways and mixing in a kind of, um, difficult way, uh, different voices, different uh, approaches. And I think it's the first thing to be said. Uh, secondly, um, and this is not only a question, it's a provocation, Sebastian. Uh, I think that the book is much more than a, a book of interviews, right? Uh, and, and, and I think it's good. It's good what you add in the, in the beginning and at the end, right? The conclusion, I think, um, the way you, you construct the, the, the conclusion in the book, which is kind of recovering ideas from most of the different voices, I think is a, a, a different way of doing a conclusion, at least from the, from the Spanish epistemology. Uh, and I will say that um, I have problems with the title, right? Which is a, a kind of double title, right? Exhuming Franco and a Spain's second transition um, it's not a question, it's a comment that maybe we can then uh, return to. I will add the signo interrogativo, right? <laughs> Is there space for a second transition? Because after, after the very good job that you do, I think the, the answer is pretty clear, no. <laughs> and if there isn't a space, I will prefer not to open the second, <laughs> the second process. Uh, uh, I'm very pessimistic as Andreu Navarra, uh, Andreu Navarra is and other voices uh, because uh, the book um, uh, talks about three different temporalities, I think, right? The moment of the exhumation, the moment when you start working on the book and today <laughs> when we are thinking about the book, right? And I think today, we are farther from a good second transition than when you wrote the book. And when you wrote the book, actually we were 
indeed, <laughs> farther from a group transition uh, uh, compared to to what it could be two years ago, right? So, uh, and of course, Vox, but not only Vox, what is happening from Madrid, and I think Magda can, can talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, this new idea of centralization, the state, um, this new um, centrality of Madrid as a new, as a new, uh, I will not say a new golpe, no, but yeah, I would like to discuss this, um, the current situation compared to when you wrote the book mm -hmm. and to when uh, the exhumation happened, right? But I think it's interesting the levels of untranslatability, right? That the that the topic and the book explain, right? So how can we explain Francoism, the Spaniards it, themselves, and what levels of uh, mm, new levels of um, meaning you can you as other foreign uh, researchers can introduce, right? Uh, in my opinion, was uh, it's it's remarkable that the most um, or the, the interview where I learned most uh, was the one that you did with another Dutch uh, researcher, right? Uh, um, Ristova, I don't remember the name is um, Mar Maria Ristova. Marija, right? Yeah. Ristova, no. And it I, I found that interesting, right? So two guys from <laughs> from a very a very different. Um, tradition uh, talking about Spain and about the, the, um, the legacy of, of Franco and about the uh, about politics of memory, which are uh, you introduced a, a kind of, of uh, um, language that is not common, right? <laughs> in the country, uh, in Spain itself, right? You're completely right um, that it, it's trying out something new. And to a large extent, as you said, it's a new epistemology. Like it's it's a journalistic approach on a journalistic timeline. In the sense, I mean, what you point out is really true. That I, I did the interviews for the book mostly uh, a year and three months ago, or so, a year and four months ago. Um, then, um, when I wrote the book, things had already changed, and now the book is out a year later, and things have already changed again. So the risk of of being that close on current events is that you are very quickly uh, caught up by those events, right? In that sense, the journalistic approach in a book form in English and uh, published in the US is, is a risky proposition. Um, it's also different in the sense that it's not monologic at all, right? I, I speak with people and I don't always make clear what I think myself, right? I, in, in part, I play the journalist in the sense that I become the channel for different voices. And I sort of ex let those voices ex ex exist ne next to each other in juxtaposition and in disagreement. And I don't intervene myself to say who might be right, who might be wrong, right? In part, it's that, um, that position, even though you write that in the, in the conclusion, I, I do end up proposing the basic idea that those who continue to say that Spain occupies a very specific and different position from many other countries that deal with complicated pasts, I tried to, to um, nuance that saying, well, Spain is less different than many of us think and that many of the Spanish left think, right? Um, and I, I think what I do um, clearly do in the book is I call out part of the Spanish left for its tactical use of Spain's difference, difference as a tool uh, to critique the current situation in Spain. Like, the, like in Germany, things would have been different. In France, it would have never happened. In the Netherlands, this would never happen. That use of, the other, of other Western countries as positive examples compared to which Spain compares negatively has been a very useful tool within Spain itself. But I conclude that it's it's not as useful anymore as, as it was. Um, what I'm interested to hear um, Magda about is, is to what extent you think that interviewing people, hearing their voices and staying very closely on current events also has disadvantages and pitfalls. Um, what is the role really that you see Magda of people who like me write about Spain from outside with, with lots of lines to Spain, lots of connections in Spain, lots of 
lots of information flow back and forth, um, but still from the outside, right? So I'm actually in that sense, contravening a journalistic principle, right? I'm writing about a place that I'm not physically myself in, right? And that seems to go straight against the, the basic rule of journalism, which is like, you go to the place to report on it, right? So I'm curious, Magda, how you see the role of those of us who write about Spain from the outside and try to somehow intervene in the Spanish public sphere and at the same time write for publics that are not Spanish. Unfortunately, uh, lately we are all interviewing people uh, uh, in places where we are not. So what you did, it's what we are doing, especially after the pandemic times. No? But um, I think you, you said that was an experiment and I also feel it like this. Uh, because you put these questions on people we we normally don't talk among mm -hmm. us. So these questions you do, we normally say what you said, no? Oh, that would never happen in another country, no? And I think sometimes it's too easy to, to say that, no? It's a good excuse. What I feel with all this is, uh, as Ignacio said, yeah, this second transition will never come. But uh, there is an expression, I don't know in English, I don't know in Catalan, is uh, se te ha pasado el arroz. I think we have, uh, we didn't, we have this complicated past, you said, and we have a very complicated future. But mm -hmm. not only Spaniards, uh, fascism is here again, and it's, um, yeah, uh, eating from different bases in every, in every country. But we, of course, we have this particularity, we have our special uh, fascism. But it's a global problem now. And this centralization is also another contradiction. We have, um, for instance, now we are negotiating how to buy vaccines. And who decides that? Who is deciding all this? Madrid, Europe? We really don't know. And then there are these companies. So it's a kind of pity that we couldn't do as a country this transition because now we don't have time. Se nos ha pasado el arroz, really. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have to fight with another uh, weight of fascism. And, and we are talking about bots, and then we talk about, uh, we're still heading in Spain in, in the 14th of February, this homage uh, to División Azul, to these uh, soldiers, mm -hmm. Spanish soldier, soldiers um, with, with, the, uh, Hitler, with the Nazis army, no? and they celebrate that it was very normal, it happened nothing. No? We need to make this, uh, to make us uh, these questions uh, we will never do us, um, by ourselves, also this, but we don't have too much time. So we have to read the book mm -hmm. and then we have to, to go to another step. It's, it's really stressing, no? Like, oh, I, I put love to, to think and to, to say, okay, now we can begin another thing. But unfortunately, I think we will not be able to do that. What you described, Magda, is, is very interesting. It also goes to the temporality, right? The rush we feel in the, 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 um, the pressure. Um, I think, in principle, the university has always been thought as the refuge from that pressure, right? If the journalist has to work day to day, a daily deadline, uh, and now an hourly deadline between, between social media and, and um, online publication. In principle, the academy is thought of the place where people can take a distance, spend a long time studying things, pondering them and coming out with much more weighty um, but more relevant reflections. The reason that I'm moving, I've moved away from that in this book is because I feel that um, reality moves too fast almost for the academy to have any kind of real impact in it. Plus the fact that if you publish in English about Spain in an academic journal or, um, or publisher, um, the ch chances are that will that whatever you, you write will never ever make it to Spain. It will not be read in Spain. It will not be commented in Spain uh, and it will not have an impact in Spain. Um, that said, becoming the journalist myself means giving up on that, on that privilege of looking at things with more distance, with more rigor, uh, with more exhaustiveness, because if anything, this little book is not exhaustive. It's very partial, it's very imbalanced. Um, in, in many ways, um, but that's, that's the difficult negotiation, right? To try to um, comment on current events because of the, as Magda expressed, sort of the, the, the urgency of what we are living in now, um, including the, the rise of the far right, 
at the, at the same time that we do feel also the need to take distance, to think more long-term, to be more nuanced, to be more rigorous and all that. We have like two different books in one book, right? So the, the exhumation is like the excuse, right? It's like, the, because actually I think it's in, in with the Echevarria's interview that he says, and I, I do agree, I think it's the only thing I agree with him actually, <laughs> we, uh, fortunately, which is uh, that the, the exhumation had not impact on the on the society as we all expected, right? Do you remember the the conversation that we had uh, the Ohio State University? I invited you and Professor Rossi Song as well, because that at that time, one year and a half and ago, that was a possible new topic, right? To to think about, but today we're in a new <laughs> in a new mood, right? Uh, and that, uh, that's why I think that exhumation is not that important as the discussion of the current situation in Spain is, right? And that's why I think the, the, the signo de interrogación, no? El signo de interrogación is necessary in the, or could be useful because the real discussion of this book is what's going on with Spain, <laughs> much more than what about the exhumation, right? And what about the body of Franco, no? What the book expresses is not, uh, I will say, answers to the specific question about the exhumation, is about how different are the views, even from the same, let's say, ideological side or critical side. How you experience generally the journalistic coverage of Spanish current events in the foreign media. We have been feeling like it happened, for instance, with, uh, with these terrorist attacks on in Madrid, uh, the 11th of March, uh, mm -hmm. 2004, yeah. Um, we had to read uh, the foreign media uh, to know what was going on. And now, especially with the Catalan uh, conflict, we, we, have, uh, we are doing that sometimes too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with, with Magda. So it, precisely in this, in this time of polarization, extreme polarization, that was originally in Catalonia, right? But it turned into the national sphere. So we, what we see now in Madrid is an extreme um, uh, polarization. I, I, I think you agree with me. Uh, the international view is always interesting. You can be um, equidistante as we are not able to do, to be, right? Exactly. This is something that Magda and myself, we probably have been hearing, right? For good or for bad, Spanish media, the way it operates, has very clear limitations on what can be said by whom about whom, mm -hmm. right? Um, and things have improved since the, the rise of, of journals like La Marea, right? And, and other independent media. Um, but there's an interesting way in which those of us who are physically placed outside of Spain and not dependent on Spanish institutions um, have, have relatively more freedom to say things or to allow other people to say things in a way that simply could not happen or would really be really difficult mm -hmm. within the Spanish media. Um, at the same time, American or British or whatever universities are not themselves innocent in institutional terms at all, right? There's all kinds of built-in prejudice in our own institutional makeup. And the same is true for a newspaper like the New York Times, which has its own um, ideology very clearly, right? Which, which any, every correspondent for the paper ends up filtering in some way. But the one thing I do try to do, I try to come up with questions that would not be asked in Spain. Mm -hmm. right? I try to come up, so if, if anything, my, my role as, as, as the journalist in this book has been to pose questions to, pe to people and let them answer and not really in, say too much about their answers. But in the framing that I propose, I think that does kind of reflect that outside perspective that you guys mentioned. Mm, after the, the, the work that you did, uh, Sebas, it was about 35 interviews, right? How you translated all that conversation into a book, right? It was difficult, it was frustrating. I love interviewing as an activity. That's one of my favorite things to do. Um, and so that part I really enjoyed. Putting the book together was a compositional challenge, it mm -hmm. was. And, um, and it, it, it was a book whose 
timeline was very short for an academic book. For an, and so it, I, I could have spent three more years doing the same thing and becoming getting a, producing something much more complete and balanced. Uh, but the short timeline caused it to be more imbalanced. Um, what I noticed at the end was that my own ideas had changed. So I, I, it turned out I came, I went into the project with a, in the end, what I now think of as a pretty simplified idea of what Francoism stood for, what its legacy might be, how people in Spain thought about that legacy. And I was surprised to find those strong disagreements, really like radical differences in points of view among people whom I think of as um, as belonging in the same, uh, like largely in the same ideological tradition, for example. So I was surprised at the level of diversity of views around these issues and the, ex the, the, the extent to which people on the left are willing to identify legacies of Francoism within the left and its political culture and its intellectual culture. Well, I wanna thank you, Magda and you, Ignacy, for, uh, for joining me here. Sure. Okay. And congratulations for the book, and I'll see you guys soon. Gracias. Fins aviat. Ciao. Ciao. Hola, Jaume. Hola, Marian. Què tal? Com estem? Molt bé, molt bé. Molt content d'estar aquí. Sí, i jo de qui siguis i de tot el que has fet per Sant Jordi en YC, que ha estat magnífic. Jo crec que... et fem una mica de vi? Sí, i tant. No et fa res que em tregui la màscara? No, no, per favor, jo també. Així podem respirar aquests aires de Nova York. Salut. Cheers. Que bo que és el priorat. Doncs, jo, clar, volia que la gent sapigués, primer de tot, que tot el que hem fet de dieta mediterrània, o sigui, aquest àpat que fem a migdia cada dia, ha estat guionat per tu, ha estat gestionat per tu i t'estem molt agraïdes. Jo estic molt agraït també perquè la veritat és que M'ha agradat molt fer-ho, no ha sigut un esforç, al contrari, m'ha agradat participar i jo crec que aquesta part de la dieta mediterrània pot ajudar molts americans, precisament, a sentir-se trets 
cap a Catalunya i cap a Sant Jordi. Sí, és que a més a més el fet que la dieta mediterrània tingui tantes capes culturals, començant per la literatura i que puguem presentar, no sé, tots aquests textos i en el context del quan menjar és magnífic. I aquests grans xefs que ens has invitat a participar, que són... Que són tots autors, també. Que són tots autors, això. I començant per tu. Bueno, jo soc aficionat. Bueno, però aquest llibre és molt bonic perquè, clar, explica la relació entre... Quina relació hi ha entre els macarrons amb formatge i Beethoven? O sigui, és bàsicament menjar i música, no? I com és que has fet això? Bueno, va ser un llibre de plaer, és el meu hobby. M'agrada molt la música, l'alimentació és el meu ofici, diguem, i sempre... Des de fa molts anys sempre he trobat relació entre la música i el menjar, no?, i la cuina. Però una relació que va més enllà de la inspiració, no?, perquè moltes vegades dius, home, doncs mira, aquesta peça de música em recorda canyella i llimona, no? No, no és això. O viceversa. O viceversa, no? O la canyella em recorda aquesta peça de música. Això és més... De fet, el que faig amb el llibre és parlar de cuina fent servir la música com a mirall, no?, i parlar de de coses de la cuina, de com pensem els cuiners, de la història de la cuina, i sempre ho poso davant de la música, perquè com que s'assemblen molt en molts aspectes, però la música sempre va per davant, diguem, a nivell artístic, doncs intento fer aquest diàleg que en el fons el que fa la cuina és aprendre de la música, no?, i dels músics. I m'acabes de dir que tots els guanys del llibre van a la Fundació Josep Carreras? Sí, tots els beneficis del llibre van a la Fundació per la lluita contra la leucèmia de Josep Carreras i per això tinc un interès especial en vendre el llibre, diguem, perquè tinc casos propers on la Fundació ha ajudat molt a superar casos de leucèmia i fan una tasca fantàstica. Bé, doncs a mi m'agrada, em diverteix, em gaudeixo llegint aquest llibre i he fet una petita traducció, no m'ho he dit mai. He fet el... Oh! Clar, no estic connectada a l'internet, o sigui, haurà de ser el telèfon. Puc fer uns... Puc compartir-ho, però... Bueno, primer et demanaré a tu que llegeixis un tros del que nosaltres és el primer paràgraf. Ah, sí? S'obre? Doncs llegeixo tu primer que la gent senti com és en cada i jo el busco. Aquell dia el mestre Antoni Escrivà va baixar l'obrador tot mudat lluint el seu elegant bastó i el folar de les grans ocasions. Me'n vaig a l'òpera, nois! Sempre ens deia nois. Va dir visiblement excitat i va sortir per la porta de la Gran Via amb la seva inseparable Jocelyn Toloniat, la seva dona, de Bracet. Era el 1999 i les portes del Liceu es reobrien per representar Turandot de Puccini després de gairebé 5 anys de silenci. Eren 5 o pensava que eren 10? Van ser 5 anys tancats. No sé com ho he traduït amb la veu. Aleshores, bé, jo llegiré tot l'article, o més o menys tot, perquè sí, perquè és un festival, diguem-ne... Vols que fem un altre plano una mica més proper? No, pots dir? Perquè se senti millor, bàsicament. Ah, projectaré. Caruso, pastry shops are places of culture. Master Chef Antonio Escrivá, 1931-2004, was dressed to the nines that day when he went down to the kitchen of the bakery, carrying his elegant walking stick and wearing the foulard he only wore on grand occasions. Boys, I'm going to the opera, he said with evident excitement. And he walked out the door to the Gran Via with his inseparable Jocelyn Toloniat on his arm. It was 1999 and the doors of the Liceo were about to open upon a performance of Turandot after five years of silence. 
The boss, El Jefe, as he was known in Spanish to the kitchen staff, was an opera lover and a person of exceptional artistic sensibility. But above all else, he was a grandmaster pastry chef from Barcelona. And fortunately not the only one, as Canals, Foch, Mauri, Fargas, Rivas, San Antonio, and Baches are only a few of the names that have made and continue to make Barcelona a city of patisserie. A veteran of the International Brigades used to tell the story of a time in mid-Spanish Civil War when he asked a farmer in Aragon how far he was from Catalonia, and the man responded, when you reach a town that has both a bookstore and a pastry shop, you will be in Catalonia. This anecdote, recounted by the writer and also Civil War veteran, Eduard Pons Pradas, explains in a few words how patisseries have been authentic bulwarks of culture in our country. Those of us who have had the good fortune of working in a fine pastry kitchen know about these things. Meticulousness, this is now Jamo speaking, meticulousness, love of the craft, the constant search for excellence in ingredients and technique are the daily bread of this profession, whose practitioners work at ungodly hours at an often exhausting job. The recipe listed here reflects the suggestive imaginative universe of tea biscuits, those small objects forged with a goldsmith's precision that can turn a mid-afternoon meal into a special sumptuous occasion. Caruzos are precisely that kind of tea biscuit. Caruzos appear in one of the fundamental reference books of Spanish pastry making, the Formulario Practico del Pastelero, Practical Formulas for the Pastry Chef, by Villardelli Jurnet, first published in Barcelona in 1933 and re-edited uninterruptedly until the present day, having become a classic for pastry chefs all over Spain and Latin America. And they are named in honor of the Neapolitan tenor, Enrique Caruso, who was one of the most popular and influ influential singers of the first half of the 20th century, whether for his voice and technique, or for his having been the first great star of the phonograph with hundreds of recordings. In fact, the recording of Vesti la Giubba from Leo Covallo's Pagliacci, which he did in 1902, was the first record to sell a million copies. How not to name an exquisite pastry after him. I love it. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Yeah. So, so tell us about what were you going to say? I don't know. It's a very cool story. It's, uh, yeah. Caruso life. It's a it's a it's a line worth of a film. Actually, there's a film called uh, The Great Caruso, mm -hmm. a Hollywood film, uh, which is not that good. But the, his life is like a, a film story. Uh -huh. But tell me about working in in the obrador in the kitchen of 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 uh, Escriba and, and what. How old were you? I was I was 19, 20 years old, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very good because uh, I've realized by working in the in the kitchen of a pastry shop that um, pastry shop was much more than just the recipes or creating mm. like delightful sweets. It was a lot of culture behind it, mm -hmm. and uh, Master Antonio Escriva, uh, he was a he was a very uh, metropolitan person mm -hmm. uh, and cosmopolitan, and cosmopolitan yeah. but in the sense of uh, he was a, a real uh, what we call un señor de Barcelona yes, yes. A, gentleman, a gentleman a gentleman from Barcelona yes. or a Barcelona gentleman and he loved opera he loved culture he loved museums and he tried to convey this love for art and culture to us we were just like the workforce of the pastry but he was <laughs> taking time to explain about all these things to us, which mm -hmm. I really appreciate. Yeah. And, and it, what is his relationship to Cristiano Escriva? It's his father. It's his father. Yeah. Yeah, because Cristiano Escriva is one of the people in the, um, in the Mediterranean diet yeah. um, segments. So, is that your, was that your first job in the kitchen? Uh, no. No, it was not actually the first job. Uh, it was my first job in a pastry shop. In a pastry shop. Mm -hmm. No, I started like four or five years before uh, joining Escriba team. Uh, I started with very basic jobs. I used to do paella in the, in the beach the and, uh, yeah, and <laughs> barbecue up in the mountains. So I, I did different like humble kitchen jobs mm -hmm. until I joined Escriba. And this was the very beginning of my truly career. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so where did you go after that? Well, uh, after two years working at Escriba, uh, I was really tired because it was it was a tough job. It was a tough place to work, and uh, I needed a break, so I decided to 
uh, go to the university. Mm -hmm. And I told Christian Escrivá, and he was like, no, 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 you have to work in the kitchen. And what kitchen do you want to work in? And I said, a bully. Oh. You know, was, uh, Had it just started? When was what? Oh, no, 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 no. It was a well known. Oh, no, of course. It was, it was there before. It was yeah. a well known restaurant already. Yes, yes, actually, yes. actually, this was 99 or 2000. And yeah, he called uh, Chef Ferran Adria and recommended me. Uh -huh. And I went to a bully straight away. Fabulous. Yeah. yeah. I spent five years there. And, but there was a moment of transition in Al Bulli, right? When, when it went from being a kind of French restaurant to being... Yeah, this was much French before. influence. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually Al Bulli has different um, stages. stages. Yeah. yeah. Um, the first stage was before Ferran Adria. Mm -hmm. It was a humble restaurant in the Costa Brava and then it became uh, one Michelin star French restaurant. But then when the chef quit, Ferran Adria took over and uh, the first two or three years during the late 80s was a transition and then the real revolution happened during the 90s. Mm -hmm. it's, the 90s is this time where Barcelona was blooming mm -hmm. and Catalonia was blooming and we have the Olympic Games but not only this, we have great artists, great oh, actors. Um, it was a golden age of Catalan culture and uh, the gastronomic part of it was a bullying. Mm -hmm. And actually uh, it was that successful because it had a society that supported it. Uh -huh. the, one of the key of the keys of the success of El Bulli was because the Catalan society was ready to embrace this new experimental cuisine at this time. Mm -hmm. And I joined right when it was uh, exploding all the popularity of the restaurant in the year 2000. I, I think it was 2002 or three. The New York Times cover. Uh, yes, and yeah, the, I have it. I have it downstairs. Yeah, so it was. It was. It was the mo I lived the moment of uh, maximum success of the restaurant or popularity. It was. It was. It was great being there. It was. It was such an honor and uh, and an experience. You know, I just want to make a tiny parenthesis because the last Robert Davidson in in our farewell event mm -hmm. makes the point also that. In, when the Eshampla is being constructed, that there's the, that great moment in which, um, oh, who is it? The Alcava Al Canzara. Raventos. Raventos starts making uh, champagne in, in the basement, in the, in the basement in the Eshampla. So you, that often these mom, the moments of, of great effervescence, cultural effervescence are accompanied by gastronomic effervescence. Right? Sure, yeah, big time. Um, and especially this, the end of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st, it was a really interesting moment in, in Catalan culture and still nowadays. I think it's this combination of new and old mm -hmm. that we always have, uh, especially in Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona is a city that it's, it's um, always modern. I think it was the lead that said so. It's like we are condemned you know, <laughs> to be modern. And it's, uh, I think, yeah, and th I think this is very cool, but we also have this very traditional part of the Catalan food also. So mm -hmm. this combination is what gives us a strong foundation for the creativity. Too. So after Bulli, or do you want to say anything more about it? Uh, no, it? and it was precisely uh, when I was working there that I've learned uh, this com this that the kitchen could dialogue with other disciplines, mm -hmm. and it was uh, Ferran Adria was always insisting if we travel to I don't know London to do a conference or whatever, instead of hanging out and going with other chefs to parties, whatever we went to the museum or mm -hmm. or to see this building because he was very passionate about architecture. Mm -hmm. We were constantly working with designers, um, mm -hmm. creators of all kind, and trying to learn from them. He did an amazing show in Soho, I don't know, five or seven years ago, of, of just the drawings that he did. You know, they, it was beautiful. Yeah, and and it's uh, we all learned this. The, the 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 crew that were working at the Bully at this mm -hmm. time, we learned that. Uh, the kitchen. Who else was there? Who were your companions? Uh, Eduard Chatruc, uh -huh. who now owns the Disfruta restaurant mm -hmm. in Barcelona, mm -hmm. uh, one of the best restaurants in Barcelona and Europe, actually. Uh, Uriol Castro, Mateo Casañas, who's, mm -hmm. who's in performing the, in, the, yeah. in one of the videos, and um, uh, Jordi Parra, many other chefs, mm -hmm. that, that uh, local chefs, actually, that then they have different careers. And 
and mm -hmm. but yeah they they like me they all they all dialogue with other disciplines and, and try to learn all the time amazing mm -hmm. so after after Bulli? okay so uh then chef Fernando adria offered me the possibility of uh, taking over the kitchen of uh, fundacion alicia yes. the alicia mm -hmm. foundation which was a new project back in 2005 and it was about using the culinary creativity to try to solve people's problems, people who have issues with food, like diabetes or cancer mm -hmm. or um, different conditions that affect the way you eat. So the idea behind it was to use the same creativity that we were using at Albuli, but for a social purpose or, or to try to help people. Yeah. I remember when they, in 2004, when um, Alicia was announced, and I wrote to them immediately because I wanted to do something with them in New York, and they said, oh, we have to build the building, we can't, uh, and it's, it's one, of my, uh, one of my great frustrations, we'll still have to do it. Yeah, we can make it happen. We anything. can make it happen. Yeah. And, but one of the beautiful things about Alicia is also what you were talking about before, the combination of the, of the in medieval monastery with the most modern kind of technology and kitchen. Right? Yes, and, and uh, being in Alicia was, for me, it was, uh, uh, it changed my life professionally because mm. I had the chance to work not only with, as I did in El Bulli, with creative people, but also with scientists. Right. And when I mean scientists, I mean like social scientists too. I work mm -hmm. with anthropologists, historians, but also dietitians, technologists, um, chemists. Mm -hmm. And I've learned so much from all of them. And it was a, a, a constant uh, interchange of uh, knowledge and, and methodology. So we did projects about ancient cuisine, about historical cuisine, um, Barcelona historical cuisine. Part of it is reflected in this book, mm -hmm. because this is also an historical book. This, mm -hmm. this is my other passion, uh, mm -hmm. food history. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I met Professor Paul Freeman, yes. who's also, also invited to the San Jordi. I yes. met him there. Uh, yeah, I did so many interesting things. Um, and I had this chance of applying what I've learned about cooking creativity to other fields mm -hmm. uh, and trying to apply this creativity, these creative techniques, mm -hmm. because creativity is, is a methodology, it's a technique, it's not like, mm -hmm. people tend to think as creative chefs, like crazy, you yeah, know, yeah. creators. Yeah. At El Bulli, it was a, it was a it was a job, it was a uh, everyday job, you know, it was a technique, we had methodology. So try to apply this to a more, I would say, social purpose. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was great. Amazing. And is there anything else we should know before we, before we, where did you go after that? Uh, and then, I don't know, it was my middle life crisis or something. <laughs> and uh, the, okay. yeah, they offered me to move to New York. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, because it was New York. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Kansas, yeah. no, huh? No, I can only live <laughs> in the best city in the world, which is Barcelona, or the second, which is New York. So I'm not, I'm not ready to move to the third. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not willing to move to the third, uh, which is probably Girona. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's not bad. It's okay. No, no, I'm joking. No, it was, it was the attraction. I of, know. I have, it, I have my own doubts about which one is the best. Yeah, it I'm depends joking. on the day, but uh, <laughs> it, it, um, it was a strong attraction mm -hmm. for New York that I had. And I, I knew it because I've been here many times before for work mm -hmm. and uh, they offered me this project to uh, take over this culinary studio downtown Manhattan yes. and I decided to move because it was a very nice project to to promote uh, plant-based eating yes. uh, which is something that is very uh, on trend right now oh, and, absolutely. and yeah uh, we came with the whole family nice. and we moved to New York yeah. well and I'm so happy you did cheers cheers
Oh. 
Hi, everyone. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, my name is Charlotte Whittle, and I'm a literary translator from the Spanish. And I'm joined today by Arabella Bosworth, who's a literary editor and um, uh, is someone I've had the uh, good fortune to have worked with on two books by uh, the Argentine modernist writer, Nora Lang. Uh, and that's who we're gonna discuss today. Um, I uh, thought that we, I would uh, start with a brief introduction to Lang. She was born in the um, 1900s in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, and uh, was part of um, the avant-garde milieu of Buenos Aires in the 1920s. Uh, she uh, cut her literary teeth uh, as an ultraist poet um, and was influenced by her friend Jorge Luis Borges, um, who was a fan of her work and a, a uh, and also of her uh, person. And uh, she went on uh, to just outgrow her e experimentation with avant-garde poetry during that period and to become uh, one of Argentina's most notable um, experimental prose writers. And in 1937, she published this book, Cuadernos de Infancia, Notes from Childhood, which is an account of her early childhood in the region of Mendoza in the Argentine Andes and of her return to Buenos Aires as a young woman. It's, uh, it's a book that is told in a beautiful, nostalgic, uh, hallucinatory and occasionally surreal fragments. And I'm gonna read you a couple of those in English before we move on to discussing uh, what it was like to work on this book together. Um, in the first fragment, I'll read, the young Nora Lang is observing her sisters prepare for their baptism. Susana and I looked on as Irene, Marta and Georgina got ready as mother took such care to place small orange blossom wreaths on our sister's heads from which white tool flowed to the floor. As the governess's hands adjusted a fold and Madame Lagrange straightened a curl, we felt terribly empty, as if we'd suddenly been left alone. Marta was the least shy of the three, the one who looked best in her first communion dress. It's first communion, I said baptism, but I didn't mean it. <laughs> as she approached the altar between the other two, I'm sure she was convinced she was entering one of those marvelous dreams that occupied her childhood and conferred on her that calm and indifferent air. Irene, as always, filled us with admiration. She was so tall, no one would have believed she was only 14. And when she bowed her head after taking communion, she looked so pale that I noticed for the first time despite having heard it often, how pretty she was. To me, she had always seemed too much as if she were blooming. And in those days, I couldn't imagine that beauty might go hand in hand with an air of health. Georgina's tiny figure was closer to my heart. And when I gazed at her, I briefly satisfied my weakness for anything helpless, anything needing to be watched over and protected. We left the church and went to the studio of the only photographer in town a young man who walked about as if continually searching for something. When he turned to look at his camera, he would spin back around quickly on one foot, revealing a pallid face and an almost pink, narrow-lipped mouth that smiled as if he'd caught someone by surprise in an awkward situation. As he positioned my sisters in front of a folding screen, he took their chins between his thumb and forefinger, and after trying 10 times to find their most flattering angle, took a small balletic jump back and arranged himself into a sweet and effeminate pose. That morning in the studio, we saw on the table a shoebox shrouded by a kerchief, which when he noticed our interest, he lifted with great care. Inside, motionless, a white rabbit with pink cloudy eyes lay dying, so slowly that the photographer kept returning his gaze to the box 
taking advantage of any excuse, while he left his clients surrounded by columns and Versailles staircases to go over on tiptoe and attend to his rabbit's death. Susanna and I stayed beside the box while our sisters tried to hold their pose. When I heard the shutter snap, my gaze drifted instinctively from the rabbit to Georgina's sheer white figure. I don't know why, but Georgina seemed somehow linked to the large white rabbit, and I had to make sure that her eyes weren't pink, but blue and gleaming. As I stroked the rabbit, I began to feel afraid and decided to get closer to Susanna and ask, ask if she'd noticed the likeness. But at that moment, the photographer covered the box and bid us goodbye, as if wishing to be alone for those silent death throes in which everything seemed so entirely pleasant and proper. All afternoon, I tried not to think of what had happened. But when my sisters took off their white dresses, I was convinced I would find no relief until I said it aloud. The next, um, the next section I'm going to read um, is more is uh, more interior. It uh, is a the section in which Nora recounts uh, a childhood accident and her relationship to the scar that was left by this incident. I'll never be able to forget it, since my finger still bears a white mark that hums with static whenever it brushes against anything. I was eight years old. One morning, I tried to slice through a loaf of bread, one of those loaves, loaves with slightly raw dough in the middle, which my sisters and I all loved equally. The knives had just been sharpened, and the bread knife, with its serrated edge, complicated the simple operation of slicing. Someone snatched the knife away from me. I grasped at it stubbornly, but my hand arrived a little too late, and instead of the handle, met the knife's sharp, undulating blade. One of my sisters tugged at it. As my fingers slipped along its edge, I felt as if something hot had been left on the knife. I soon realized that this was the pain, and that, as it left my hand, the blade had sliced open my ring finger to the bone. Despite my having to keep it bound to my chest for several weeks, when they removed the bandage, the whitish scar looked more alive than ever. After a while, I began to forget about it, began to provoke less often the kind of electric current I experienced when rubbing it, which gave me a strange and pleasant sensation. One night around the new year, we were allowed to drink some champagne. I wanted to feel sad, since I thought it's fitting to drink and be sad. When I went to bed, a little less tired than usual. For a long time, I lay there thinking of tragic, ailing women, their hands stretched out on a quilt or sitting beside a window. But my bed seemed to be tilting to one side. I can't remember if, when I touched the scar by accident, I gave it the nervous tap I'd neglected for a long while which caused a shiver to run down my arm like a dog repeatedly licking the palm of a hand. A sudden tingling seemed to lift the finger away from the others, and the tingling to translate into a word, ikilinkili. I thought I had misunderstood, and as I gently lifted my hand, I saw the finger rise to gaze at me as it said, ikilinkili. Ikilinkili seemed to imply a re reproach or a grievance, since I didn't keep watch on the finger every day. Itilinkili, itilinkili, I heard it say over and over until I fell asleep with the sense that it was still standing all through the night, telling me of its woes. After that, whenever I drank a little, I would see it stand to attention and tell me its word. One night, it grew weary I no longer hear it anymore. Itilinkili, itilinkili. Charlotte, thank you for those two really brilliant readings. Thank you. I think they really capture the strangeness 
of uh, notes from childhood, but also the nostalgia and the tenderness that's all mm -hmm. wrapped up in that strangeness. And I think mm -hmm. uh, I think it's remarkable that the book talks or deals so well with the inherent oddness of childness and yet makes it somehow light and fresh and tender at the same time, but yet continually uncanny. And I wondered if, with this in mind, you could tell us a little more about Nora Lang's uh, background and her development as an author and what drew you to her as a translator. Sure. Um, well, so um, my uh, relationship with Lang began about, 10 years ago, or maybe 11. Um, the first book I read by her was uh, Notes from Childhood. And I was, um, I was struck really by exactly the qualities that you, that you describe. This um, ext extremely tender nostalgia that somehow um, has such a sense of the strangeness of childhood that it is not, um, ever saccharine or overly sentimental. Mm -hmm. It somehow, it somehow conveys um, this, this nostalgia for a, a lost time, uh, but also has these extraordinary flashes of insight into um, how sort of unsettling things can be from the perspective of a, of a young person who has a, a partial understanding of what is going on in the world around her. And Nora Lang um, had a, a relatively privileged early life. She was born in uh, Buenos Aires, but went as a, as a very small child to uh, the region of Mendoza in the in the Argentine Andes, where her father, who was a, a geographer and a surveyor, was um, was working, and in that region she lived uh, a rural life in a tiny, on the outskirts of a tiny tiny town, um, and she was one of five sisters. Um, sh they were. Uh, very well loved and taken care of by their parents. Um, they, ha they had a governess and they had just a small number of domestic staff. And uh, the young Lang seems to have been uh, a sort of a eccentric kind of a spy as a child who, while, while she's enjoying this uh, relatively privileged you know, upbringing where she has, you know, she has a governess and she has a French teacher who she visits um, and has a, a, fa a fairly pleasant domestic existence. She is also observing what's going on in the margins on her farm. She, she notices the people living in the little huts on the outskirts of the, of the Quinta where they live. And she, is, she becomes aware of poverty and suffering as she observes the people and the animals around her, and uh, those are the um, those are the moments uh, together with her sister's adolescence and these sort of coming of age moments that they have as girls that provide these moments of uncanny that that tend to kind of poke through the the smooth surface of this you know uh, relatively sort of tranquil setting. And, and these beautiful surroundings. And I think something you just mentioned there about it's domestic, the, the, the book's domestic qualities. It mm -hmm. is, is that something you could talk about a bit more because she is dealing with the domestic, which I suppose is something which for a long time women have sort of seen, women writers have dwelled in that area, but yet she's mm -hmm. used such experimental prose. And it's a very interesting sort of undoing of uh, stereotypes in some ways. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, you know, it's fascinating because Lang does, um, she does portray um, motherhood in a very positive light. The, the, the mother in, in this um, book is a very hallowed figure who is thoroughly dedicated to you know, uh, childbirth, you know, birthing and rearing these children. 
but there are also these moments uh, of sort of whispering and spying that make femininity and the domestic seem, um, as we as we've said, uncanny, which is a, which is a word that comes comes up often when I'm talking about Lang. Um, for instance, this is an extraordinary scene where um, the, one of the younger children, who's a, a baby, is fussing, and there's only one um, sister, an older sister, who's able to calm him down. And the other sisters are listening at the door, and they want to know what it is, what kind of tricks this um, this older sister is playing to be able to get the baby to to settle down. And and when they finally go into the room to see what's going on, they find the um, 13 or 14 year old sister sitting on the bed um, with her um, her dress folded down and she's pretending to breastfeed the baby. She's just, she's given the, the child access to her breast even though she's not she's not lactating. And this is a moment where you know this sort of um, the the reality the, and the strangeness of um, you know child rearing sort of uh, you get this glimpse of of how um, sort of unsettling that can be from a from a child's perspective. Right? So um, yeah, I am. Um, I suppose leading on from that, it's it's a, much of the book is this sort of gradual development of Nora as a feminine presence as a, a shift right. towards adolescence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That example is a, a perfect one of, of her becoming aware of right. uh, a sort of like female body. Um, mm -hmm. sort of, yeah, the, the development of the feminine subjectivity and authorial intent. And, and could you talk, is that something that you thought of a lot about when you were translating? How did that? Absolutely. Um, abs absolutely. This, um, this is Bagel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I did think a lot about the the, the development uh, of her as a sort of a speaking, you know, feminine subject. Having said that, um, there are sort of there are these snapshots in the uh, in the book where Nora, at various ages, is sort of negotiating her relationship to her gender. There's a scene when um, the the um, the, the the commissioning agent comes from Buenos Aires and he's brought the clothing that the family has ordered, you know, for him to buy for them. And um, the family, as a joke, dress the young Nora up in a little uh, a little boy's page suit. And it's because um, people have often said um, to, to the young Nora that she looks like a boy. And she said that she had uh, up until the age of six or so when this this incident happened she had always taken it as a compliment but mm -hmm. um but she realized she realizes at this moment when they dress her up in this little boy's outfit this little suit and uh, put her up in, on the table and laugh at her and say how much she looks like a little boy she really she has this sudden realization that this is just you know she's being treated as a as an um as a spectacle and this is just absolutely outrageous <laughs> and she um and so she throws a tantrum you know so she's um she and she has a, a strange relationship to femininity where she she thinks that in order to be a real woman a real young woman you should really um spend a lot of your time sort of sighing and fainting and swooning um we got a we got a little bit of, a little bit of that in the in the uh, scene from the first communion right where she says that um her older she admired her older sister but she looked a little bit too healthy to be uh, <laughs> to be a true example of feminine beauty you know um, the other in instance that uh, comes to mind is later on in the book, in a, in a chapter which or a section which I think is really emblematic of Nora discovering and wielding her own voice. Um, she likes to dress up in men's clothes and go up onto the roof and uh, basically shout at the neighbors, shout down at them, sort of rain uh, rain words on them in different languages and uh, just generally sort of guffaw and make a ruckus. And uh, it's like, it's like she's sort of, she's testing the limits of her voice and she's, uh, you know, and she's, uh, she's becoming a performer. Yeah. 
So there is there is this sense there there are these um, uh, moments where you think, well, this is quite a, this is quite a traditional approach to um, to gender and femininity. But then there are these other moments where she seems to just completely subvert that and expose um, her femininity as as basically performative. And that voice that you mentioned uh, that she's developing as, mm -hmm. as an adolescent or a young woman, um, how uh, does her how does her authorial voice change over time? You also mentioned her relationship with Borges and her sort of role as a uh, you know an experimental prose writer, an extremely important one. How mm -hmm. from Notes from Trouble, which was written when she was relatively young. How does her prose then develop over time? Like, what kind of writer does she become? Well, um, in her, um, in, let's see, in her later work, when she sort of steps into you know, full maturity as a prose stylist, um, Lang uh, writes these really e extraordinary, long, very meandering, uh, very um, Proustian sentences that um, really uh, kind of highlight uh, uncertainty and mystery as, as an aesthetic. Um, and I think that um, she, the, and that, that um, is, is quite, uh, quite distant from the poems that she wrote in her youth, which were these sort of um, you know, highly metaphorical kind of brief flashes of um, imagery uh, that often ha you know, had to do with um, sort of youthful love and longing. And um, she, she develops uh, in her later work uh, a greater sense of uh, the sort of the the really troubling uh, ideas that can be sort of hiding just behind a sentence. And, and this, the seeds for that complexity and that mm. strangeness and that disquiet, do you, did you find them all in Notes from Childhood as well, in the strangeness of the right? There is, whilst there's sort of nostalgia and freshness and lightness, there is strangeness, as we've said. And what was that? What was Absolutely. The were there challenges for you as a translator? What what sort of there must have been enormous pleasure in translating it, but what what did you come up against? What was it like to translate? I think um, you know I I think that uh, there are definitely um, instances of Lang's ma mature more mature style that are embedded already in Notes from Childhood that you see. Um, Fully blossom in uh, people in the room. For instance, the other novel that we, the other book that we worked on, which was published, she published in 1950. Um, and the uh, the challenge in this book was really to seek a balance between the the complexity of the prose, which can which can become a little bit abstract sometimes um, when you know she she sort of takes off with these extraordinary kind of. Uh, flourishes where she layers clause upon clause upon clause and um, the language is very sort of uh, luxurious and um, and uh, very um, sensual in a way um, and the the kind of intimacy that I think it, it is required by this voice for discussing these um, these very closely observed domestic moments. I think that, you know, find, finding that balance was was a, was kind of like a, you're walking along a tightrope. Yeah, it. it's the balance is really there. It's this amazingly fresh, intimate style, which almost makes you feel like you're reading your own childhood somehow. It's mm -hmm. right back there, but yet strange, strange. And, and, and there's a removal there, which is fascinating to, I found fascinating to read. Absolutely. Um, what what was it like um, to come to the, her prose as an editor? It was, I think, having worked on people in the room as well, it, I, mm -hmm. I felt prepared for the the complexity and the density and uh, the particular sentence style that she has, which, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. is the layering of layering and layering. And I think 
uh, perhaps it's a cliche, but the editors, you have to, the desire is, I suppose, always to, to the temptation is to simplify or to make right. it more accessible or to mm-hmm. say, well, that's not quite how we would express that, you know, in English and let's cut down these semicolons and start a new sentence here. Mm-hmm. And I think resisting that temptation and understanding the importance of that density yeah. and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the intention behind it all. Absolutely. Uh, I think that I found really fascinating, sort of stepping mm-hmm. back and, and reading it again and seeing uh, what was how, how purposeful that writing right. was. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I found that really fascinating. And then, then I found notes from childhood, a very different experience, but incredibly tender. And I felt very connected to the book and her description mm-hmm. of childhood and motherhood and this amazingly rural life. But as you, as we've talked about, this real deep strangeness and uncanny and disquiet, which you say it can be unsettling experiencing things as a child. And I think Mm -hmm. somehow she and you have expressed that in an incredibly intimate and perceptive way, which as an editor, I found really, it was a pleasure to work on. It was fascinating, but also somehow a a very uh, brilliant reading experience for me as well. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, I think we're we're coming right up on two thirty. That flew by. Um, is that right, Ignacio? Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, notes from childhood. It's it's out on May fourth. Morenica mi me ya.
Hello, my name is Sharon Dolan, and I'm a poet and the translator of the Catalan poet Gemma Gorga, who is here with me today to read from our forthcoming translation of her work, Late to the House of Words, Selected Poems of Gemma Gorga, which is forthcoming from Saturnalia Books in the fall of this year. We're going to read four poems from the collection. I'm going to read in English, and then she, Gemma Gorga, will read in Catalan. So this is the first poem, and you'll see how connected it is to language and how the world that we live in is really the, the world of, of language. And um, you'll hear the title of the collection within this poem. It's called Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. We showed up late to the house of words. Now we grope our way downstairs as painful as vertebrae and search between the walls plastered shards for some living syllable, sister to bread and poverty to bring to our lips, such as a name, a woman's name, the bone of a woman's name lost between the stones of these walls that once upon a time housed flesh inside, and perhaps a jewel, a little box, a mirror you could ask so many things. Hello, nice to be here. It's a pleasure to share this time. I'm going to read the same poem in Catalan. Digan, mirall. Van fer tard a la casa de les paraules. I ara baixem a les palpentes escales adolorides com vèrtebres. I busquem entre el que els sobra alguna síl·laba viva, germana del pa i la penúria, per dur-nos els llavis. Com ara un nom, un nom de dona, l'os d'un nom de dona, extraviat entre les pedres d'aquests murs que un dia foren habitats carn endins. I potser un joiell, una capseta, un mirall a qui poder preguntar tantes coses. The next poem I'm going to read is a kind of creation myth or an alternate creation myth. It's called, So Then She. With flour and water, she worked his body. With flour and saliva, she conceived, leaned, learned that with flour and both hands, you reach the secret pliability of matter. With flour and lips, she worked the man down to the unbearable elasticity of tenderness. Then slowly, she tasted his body, the bread that was his body, bread that fit as well in her hands as does light on earth. I aleshores ella, amb farina i aigua, treballava el seu cos. Amb farina i saliva concebia, inclinava, aprenia que amb farina i dues mans s'arriba el dúctil secret de la matèria. Amb farina i llavis treballava l'home fins a l'elasticitat insuportable de la tendresa. I aleshores, lentament tastava el seu cos, el pa que era el seu cos, el pa que s'emmotllava tan bé a les mans com la llum a la terra. The next poem I'm going to read is about loss and it has an elegiac tone to it. And I think we're all having a sense of loss these days. And so I thought this would be a perfect poem to read right now. And it's called Elegy. Long ago before the continents were divided and we began counting our lives in years, it was still possible to pick up a pin prick a hole in the porous shell and joyfully suck the embryonic yellow of the yolk mixed with the egg whites, moist light. A journey through secret tunnels displaced matter and food from one concavity to another, from the slippery darkness of beginnings to the definitive darkness of the throat. That was a long time ago when hens laid eggs in the improvised shadow of four planks, 
when dogs gnawed on carcasses and Sunday leftovers and seemed happy, when bacteria hadn't colonized all the meridians of fear, microscopes slept, and we ate in peace the simple fruit of the earth. Yes, somehow it seems prophetic, but the poem is inspired in, in my childhood when I used to, to eat raw these eggs, you know, and, and live without thinking that everything was harmful or threatening or whatever. This is real happiness. <laughs> Alagia. Temps enrere, abans que se separessin els continents i comencéssim a comptar en anys les nostres vides, encara era possible agafar una agulla de cap, picar un foradet en la closca porosa i xuclar amb delit el groc embrionari del rovell, barrejat amb la llum mullada de la clara. Un viatge per túnels secrets desplaçava matèria i aliment d'una concavitat a una altra, de la foscor lliscadissa dels inicis a la foscor definitiva de la gola. D'això fa molt de temps, quan les gallines ponien ous a l'ombra improvisada de quatre taulons, quan els gossos rosegaven carcanades i sobralles dominicals i semblaven feliços, quan els bacteris no havien colonitzat tots els meridians de la por, els microscopis dormien i nosaltres menjàvem en pau els fruits senzills de la terra. This is the final poem that I'm and we are going to read and it's the last poem in the collection and it comes from Gemma Gorga's most recent collection of poems and it's called Decreation. Learn from crabs the peaceful art of going backwards. Learn to unlearn, go shoeless, digress. Surprise yourself yet again. Look at an apple until you liberate it from the fine dust of allegory. Know nothing about what you should know. Forget artificial rhetoric and the boring mechanics of the atom. Look without saying, I am looking. Love without saying, I am loving. Leave verses unfinished. Leave verses. Leave. De creixement. Aprendre dels crancs, l'art pacífic d'anar enrere. Aprendre a desaprendre. Descalçar-se, desviar-se, sorprendre's i de nou sorprendre's. Mirar una poma fins a alliberar-la de la polsina de l'alegoria. No saber res del que s'ha de saber. Oblidar la retòrica sintètica i la mecànica avorrida de l'àtom. Mirar sense dir estic mirant. Estimar sense dir estic estimant. Deixar els versos inacabats. Deixar els versos. Deixar. Thank you, Gemma. Thank well, you, Shane. <laughs> you know, I began translating your work with the book of prose poems, Book of Minutes. And of course, um, we had both talked about the fact that we were both not really prose poets, but yet that's what drew me to your work initially. And that's the first book I translated. And then here I was finally coming to the rest of your work, the majority of your work, the lion's share of your work, which is really mm -hmm verse, um, poetry written in lines. And, um, and it was a delight to sort of come back to thinking about the line in poetry, which to me is so primary. Um, and, and I've loved, it's been a labor of love. I've loved translating your work. I'm, I'm wondering what it's been like for you to be translated by me. What has that experience felt like in our exchanges going back and forth? Um, yeah, yes. it's. It's a strange sensation because it's the, the opportunity of revisiting the poems from another point of view. It's from outside 
but at the same time from inside. So sometimes when, when you um, asked me about some detail, I, I really had to think twice because, because I, I didn't remember. <laughs> so it's, it's like entering again in my own work from a different door right right very strange. yeah it is it is um and you know i was trying to think because of course you know i'm a poet as well i was trying to think if it had somehow influenced my writing mm -hmm. um if it made me think differently differently about my work i i have a feeling it's an unconscious process that it may be has seeped into my own in, into my own writing i'm not yet sure exactly how but I know I, in the same way that I worry over where to, where to end the line, I worried about each one of your lines and when you would break the line at a noun or when you would break the line at a preposition, I would think about it. Of course, the syntax of English is not nearly as, as flexible. It's different than, than Catalan. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were differences, of course. Um, and then I'm just thinking about the, the final poem where um, I remember talking to you about it in Decreation where in the Catalan, it's not actually written in the imperative. And I asked you, I felt it somehow in English, it would not really work as well to say, you know, to learn from crabs, the peaceful art of going backwards to, you know, to, to look without saying that somehow putting it in the imperative saying, look, without saying you're looking, that somehow it would be much more effective. I mean, that was um, a liberty that I, uh, that I took and you seem, to be, you seem to be okay with it. I'm just, I'm just aware of that again, as I just reread that poem and I love that poem. Thank you. I, I think you are very faithful translating. And at the same time, you have this, uh, this uh, creation, this, uh, but uh, above all, I feel you like a, a faithful translator, a very respectful translator. And yeah, and I thank you for that. <laughs> um, well, thank you. I, I, you know, I, as I keep on, I keep on quoting Valérie, you know, who says the poem is never finished, merely abandoned. And I feel like my translations of your poems are never mm -hmm. finished, merely abandoned. Well, you know, now that of course I had to turn in the final draft to my mm -hmm. publisher, to Saturnalia Books, I'm just so excited that the book is going to be coming out this October, I found out. Um, so of course I had to come up with final drafts. And, um, and then of course I look at them again and I'm thinking, well, should there be a, an article there? I took the article out. I mean, not the, yes, should I, should there be a definite article? I, I, made, I made choices, you know, I'm thinking in elegy where I would choose, you know, to leave out an, um, an article or, you know, just these smallest choices, you know, this is, this is what poets do. We think about the every, every aspect of the, of the language. Um, yes, those details. Uh, make the difference, right? Well, it's a different music. It's a different music, leaving an article in, taking an article out. There's a great flexibility in English around, around doing that, especially in poetry, it feels to me. So I made those, I made those, those choices. And I guess those are my aesthetic choices as well. Um, I'm just wondering, is there anything else we'd like to tell everyone who's going to be listening? I don't know. I'm just very excited about the the coming for, of this new book. So, me yeah. too. I think it will really give English language readers a chance to read much more widely in your work. I know that there were many people who loved, as I continue to love, Book of Minutes, which were the prose poems. But it's just such a small portion of your work and now you'll get to see the full range of what it is you're 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 doing and um so maybe this is a good place for us to end and to say thank you to everybody and happy thank san you. jordi thank you bon san jordi yeah. bye <laughs> today i'm going to give you some tips how to buy in a traditional market welcome to la bucaria and don't forget the mask. The two important things you need are 
a basket, and then the least. You have to prepare at home a least when you're not too hungry to be very realistic and to know what you really need. It is very important to take a look in the different stalls and to realize what do you really need, check the prices, the quality of the products. I also recommend to support the local producers and to choose seasonal products. The strawberries, asparagus, peas, all kinds of tomatoes. And the artichokes. Hola, em posaries fresons? Moltes gràcies. Seguirem venint. Hola. The stall holders are the specialists of the products. They can really help you in how to cook, how to cut everything, and then you create a relation with them and they finally know exactly what you really like. Em posaries unes tallarines, per favor? Posa'm també quatre galeres, que faré un caldito. Vinga, doncs ja ho tinc. Doncs vinga, moltes gràcies, eh? While I check my list, I take a break and I order a capipota, please. It's an excellent tapa here in La Boqueria. Bon dia. Com esteu? When you buy fish, it's really important to make sure that it's fresh. The gills have to be really red, the eyes shiny. Mira, una brocheta. Una brocheta. Què te va fer? Sí. Que es veiem aviat. Bé, bonica. La carn, em falta. I'm gonna buy some ground fresh meat that I can use to make lasagna, canelloni, a lot of things. Em poses una mica de carn per picar-la? This meat is really fresh. You can buy the charcuterie fresh or vacuum sealed. Posa'm una mica de llangonissa d'aquesta d'Organyà. I'm gonna ask them to vacuum seal to keep it for longer. Gràcies. Something really typical to buy in the markets of Catalonia is the legumes already cooked. Beans, garbanzos, lentils. They're delicious. Gràcies. Adéu. Almost done. Just missing the bread and the cod. Salted cod is one of the most popular fish in Catalonia. You can buy it salted, different pieces of the cod, or already soaked in water for five days. Depends on it depends on how thick it is. Sí, dues penques posa. The most typical is bacallà a la llauna, but you can also make it with tomato, capers, olives, whatever you want. Moltes gràcies. I think I have everything I need. Vegetables, fruit, fish, meat. Here in the market, we can buy everything we need, always supporting the local producers and the best, best quality. M'ha agradat molt sempre llegir Josep Pla i Contraband sempre el recordo com un llibre de joventut que em va emocionar. There's nothing I like as much as garlanding roast peppers with virgin olive oil. Then I sing happily, I talk to the oil, to the fruits of the earth. I love roast peppers, not to roast it, that ruins them, but with the inside easy to get at when you lift off the burned skin. I spread them on the plate in an exciting sequence and garland them with oil and a pinch of salt. And I dunk lots of bread, as the poor people do, in the oil mixed with salt and flavored by the roast peppers. Then I pick up a bit of pepper and a bit of bread between my thumb and my index finger. I raise them avidly, eucharistically. I stare at them in the air. Sometimes I reach a point of ecstasy of orgasm. I close my eyes and gulp down the motherfucker.
El óleo de oliva es un ingrediente básico en la cuina catalana y en la dieta mediterránea. Sin duda es uno de los tres diferenciales que tenía. Welcome to Lamporda. Bueno, lo fen serví en la mayoría de recetas de cuña catalana. Pero ni a una que es bastante especial. Bueno, que también barrecha un concepto mol catalán, que es barrecha lo dulce y lo salado. Tenim pa, en la que a Cataluña de bien pa de payés. Eh? Aquí es pa, pues no está turrat, pero podría estar turrat. ¿vale? No, a eso cada uno decidéis cómo vole el pa. Es decir, ni hay muchas recetas, muchas maneras de ver la receta de pan chocolate, Yoli. Aquí está, eh? la dejan tal cual. Y en aquel caso, podían pusarlo tal cual, bueno, y menjártelo, pero haré una mica también moderna y lo que haré es rayarlo. Ahora le voy a dar un cop de, de for o dejarlo tal cual, en aquel caso, ¿vale? Para que estén en el yoga, no estén, ¿no? Y no tenemos un foro acostado, lo dejaré en tal cual, que está muy bueno. Le pusaré sal, sal en aquel caso, ¿vale? Le pusaré sal gruesuda en escatas y al final el óleo de oliva, que es en saducta, es un ingrediente fantástico de la dieta mediterránea. ¿Vale? Y acabemos con el óleo de oliva. O es para brenar o también para la hermosa. Y la verdad es que está muy bueno. Mm. Mira, un libro muy interesante: La fisiología del gusto de Brillat Chavarén, que nos trata desde el Bully Books a Marjuí Racionero en FED la versión del siglo XXI, que ha surgido para que San Jordi. Allí van a sugerir eso por un costat el, ori el original, bueno, y la versión que va a hacer Lluís Racionero, que va, va a morir, y la verdad es que son muy divertidos. Donkey fixed to the pious olive tree, lenient tree, sentient beast. The great tree, in its dotage of glee, laughs at the house and the darkening stream. The tired donkey neither yearns nor awaits the ancient god crowned in thorns. His brays ring out on the crooked trail like a scrap of orient mourned. You are two gifts of the sacred land where the aurora appears in rosy span. O oh, testaments to that lovely bluff Prophetic beast, whom a fool would query, wholesome tree ready to parley. Your silver is the dust of immortal stuff.
Um, hello, um, everyone. Um, we're going to, this is Andrea Bayani, and I'm um, Elizabeth Harris, I'm Liz Harris, um, and we're going to be talking about, um, about this new novel, uh, If You Kept a Record of Sins, which has just come out recently with Archipelago Books. Um, first, I'm going to read Andrea's uh, bio uh, from this book. Um, so Andre uh, Bayani is a novelist, journalist, and poet. His novel, Oni Promessa, Every Promise, won the uh, Baguda Prize in 2011. His collection of short stories, La Vita Non è in Ordine Alphabetico, won the Settembrini Prize in 2014. Excuse my pronunciation, Andrea, how embarrassing. If You Kept a Record of Sins, received the Brancati Prize, the Recanati Prize and Lo Straniero Prize. He teaches at Rice University in the Department of Classical and European Studies. Thank you. And so uh, about Liz, about Elizabeth Harris, it's my turn and so it's your turn. Uh, <laughs> so Elizabeth Harris has translated Tristano Dies for Isabel and Mandala and Stories with Pictures by Antonio Tabucchi, that is a wonderful writer, as well as fiction by Mario Rigonistern, Giulio Mozzi, and Claudia Durastanti. For her translations of Tabucchi, she received the Italian Prose in Translation Award and the National Translation Award for Prose. And I would add that she is kind of a genius. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh. Um, and I would add, because I forgot, um, is that uh, Andrea Bayani's newest novel, um, um, Il Libro delle Case is actually up for a major prize in uh, Italy. It's one of the 12 finalists for the Stre Strega Prize, which is a very, very big deal. So, um, so what we're going to do first is, um, is read from, from this book. And the way that we're going to do it is I'm going to read the first paragraph of a chapter pretty early on in the book, um, just to the, the novel starts with the narrator going to Romania, flying into Bucharest to bury his dead mother. Um, and this is a very early chapter. Um, and I'm gonna read the first paragraph and then Andrea is gonna follow immediately after with the Italian uh, first paragraph. And then I'll continue reading uh, the rest of the chapter. It's very small. You started leaving when I was young. The first trip was for pleasure, to go meet some friends who were off trying to strike it rich. You drew the world on a sheet of paper the night before to show me where you were going. We're here, you said, and tomorrow I'll be right down here in this spot. You drew a line with a red marker from home to there. It's a bridge, you said. It's like crossing the river to the other side. And under the bridge, we colored everything blue. We filled in the water of Europe. Then we taped the picture to the refrigerator and that's where it stayed for years to come. Hai cominciato a partire che ero piccolo. La prima volta è stato un viaggio di piacere andare a trovare degli amici che avevano tentato la fortuna. Mi avevi disegnato il mondo sopra un foglio la sera prima e mi avevi fatto vedere dove andavi. Noi siamo qui, mi avevi detto, e domani io sarò in questo punto qua giù. Avevi tracciato una riga con un pennarello rosso che partiva da casa e arrivava fin lì. È un ponte, dicevi, è come passare dall'altra parte del fiume. E così sotto il ponte avevamo colorato tutto di blu, avevamo riempito d'acqua l'Europa. E poi il foglio l'avevamo attaccato con lo scotch allo sportello del frigo e lì è rimasto per gli anni a venire. Hey, I'm actually going to take off my headphones. Can you still hear me? Okay. Is it all right? Yeah. Um, because I was hearing music in my headphones. So at first you weren't gone for very long, a few days, a couple of weeks at most. I waited for you, but I wasn't worried. You don't worry when someone has crossed the river to the other side, but then comes back right away. Dad wasn't happy, but he didn't let on. In the morning, he took me to school. In the afternoon, he came and got me and took me back home and never said a word. When you weren't there, I found a thousand excuses to disappear into the kitchen and get something from the refrigerator. I went just to see that drawing of the world, to run my finger over that red bridge that had sprung up between you and me. Then I'd open the fridge and every time I thought I'd see you in there, like I'd opened a window. But instead of you, there'd be the usual carton of milk with the cow. 
the package of processed cheese and dad's cans of beer. Once dad came into the kitchen while I had my face stuck in the fridge and he asked me where, what I was doing. I told him what you always said when you opened the refrigerator. I'm checking to see if we need something from the store. But then you always came home and I didn't guard the refrigerator and dad regained his voice. The first time you went to Romania, you showed us pictures of your friends. You held out the photos and said, I've never seen people laugh so much. And they certainly were laughing in those photos. But then again, people always laugh in photos. I knew them well, these friends of yours. They used to come over quite a bit with their wives and children. You all would talk into the evening about work while we sat on the rug in front of the TV, watching and laughing and finally falling asleep on the floor. Then they suddenly stopped coming over, maybe because they'd crossed the river to the other side. I still saw the children at school. Your friends' wives would pick them up at the entranceway. Sometimes after school, you took me to the firm because you had work to finish. So I'd wait in your office on the second floor with my school notebooks open and would pass the time going up and down on your swivel chair. Sometimes I'd leave and go out to the mezzanine and lean over the rail. From up there, I'd watch you hurry through the lobby, someone beside you talking, you nodding, and at some point he'd stop. And I liked that to talk with you, people had to walk with you, had to ask to walk along beside you, and then they'd turn and go back the way they came. When it was getting late and I'd finish my homework, I would go out again and sit on the mezzanine, my legs dangling down, and I'd look below at the fluorescent lights that kept growing brighter. The few remaining office workers would be wandering around in their shirt sleeves, their ties loosened. Sometimes you'd signal to me as if to say, almost done, and I'd answer with a wave of my legs, my hands gripping the rails. The last to arrive at night was your partner. Before that, there was no leaving. When he did arrive, you'd follow him into his office and you two would shut yourselves in for a while and I couldn't see or hear you. Sometimes I even fell asleep, my legs through the rails. When I awoke, it felt like I was on a swing. Then you'd find me after your partner left and you'd slip my notebooks into my backpack. Call dad, you'd say because if I called, maybe he wouldn't be angry. So we'd go down the metal stairs and step outside to nightfall, to the empty lot and your car that seemed abandoned in the middle of nowhere. Wanna shift gears, you'd ask in the car, and off we'd go, your foot on the clutch and both my hands on the gear shift, until we reached home, a bit herky-jerky, the slope to the house, the most difficult part. We'd stop in the driveway, and every time you'd say, be good now before you turned off the ignition. Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can say just that I'm very grateful uh, to you uh, for that. And uh, um, it's amazing from my perspective to see, um, we, we, we talked with Liz, we talked a lot about, uh, about music. And it's strange when you are doing literature and when your job is to write and translate uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, um, um, I guess one of my, of my obsessions, I would say, while writing is to, to have a sound, to, to create a sound with words. Uh, and it's generally something that uh, uh, it's connected to, to kind of a, a natural attitude. I want to create a kind of a sound of a music that comes from maybe lots of work, but then is a very, very natural gesture. And, um, and it's like, yeah, those dancers, you see they are very natural, but they, it's so hard to, if you try to do what they, what they do. Um, and so um, we here, we are very happy and glad to, to be here talking because we always talk about just phrases and sentences uh, in dot and period and uh, whatever, uh, on, on about the translation, but we, we, we never have so much the chance to talk uh, with an audience uh, and, and to ask uh, to each yeah. other questions. And so the, I, I want to ask you, I want to ask you a okay. question. Go away. A question, yeah. And the question was, uh, so when, what was the, 
because I never asked you that, uh, what was the, the feeling you had the first time you heard that music and how, uh, how, how was it? Was, was it, you, you felt, oh my God, it's so hard to do that or okay, let's play together. <laughs> um, so when I, the first chapter, the first chapter of this novel is a paragraph. It's just a paragraph long. And I read that paragraph, Andrea, and um, as soon as I read it, I thought, um, I thought, oh, my God, this is gorgeous. And I, I really, really want to translate this, you know, so it was immediate, actually. Um, and, um, and it never stopped actually feeling, feeling that way for me. It, it, I mean, of course, it's challenging, you know. Um, but it was such a it was such a pleasure to to translate this that um, um, I was going on vacation in Colorado while I was translating translating this. We were scheduled for a vacation, and um, you can ask my partner. I actually was fairly grumpy about leaving for my vacation. I just didn't really want to stop. I mean, once I got there, it was fine, but I didn't want to be you know torn away from. Um, from translating your book. And that doesn't, I'm not gonna, I mean, I've been very fortunate in what I've translated. Um, I work almost exclusively with Jill Schoolman at Archipelago Books and her books are incredible. I mean, she's had me translate now several books by Antonio Tabuki and, and it's just been a dream. But I, but I will say that those books have their moments. They all had their moments where I just went, oh my God, you know, this is too hard. And, um, and with your book, I never, you know, I, it was just a dream from start to, to finish, just a beautiful journey to, to go on. Yeah, so. and, and uh, I have too many questions, then I'll let you also ask something, but uh, yeah, I'm, it's always hard to describe the style of someone, you know, and, uh, and uh, you can describe the story. And so if you, if we describe the story of this book, it's, uh, it's easy. There's a, it's a relationship right. between a mother and the son and uh, the mother leaves uh, to, uh, for her business. Uh, and she leaves Italy and goes to Romania. And then uh, the, it, it, the books open with, uh, with him getting the news that she died and those she, he has to fly there, first paragraph, to Romania for her funeral. So the story is very uh, easy. But uh, so it's always very easy to, to explain to someone uh, the story. Um, it's always very hard to, to describe the way in which uh, right. a, a book is written. Because also from our perspective as writers, uh, it, it's hard to explain. Whereas a, a translator maybe can um, it, it, it's the right it. bridge to, to, yeah. to try to, 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 yeah, to give at least the, the sense of how uh, this, this book is written. What's yeah. this style? What's yeah. the, this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, what, it's very interesting that you asked that because I've just been having a conversation with some translators on Twitter, um, sort of arguing about, about style um, and, and whether or not, um, a translator's style is different, you know, from an author's style. That it, it, do I have a style in in translating your book? And and you know, it's been an interesting uh, conversation. Um, I would say that um, that the style of your book uh, for me is um, is terse without being um, without without being impoverished. If if that makes sense, you know that it's. Uh, last night when you were speaking with Jhumpa Lahiri, she spoke of, so beautifully about the silences that, you know, that are around, around phrases, around, um, around um, sentences and paragraphs. And I would say that there's a, there's a, a great deal that happens off the page in your writing um, that, um, that I was keenly aware of when I was, when I was translating it. I, I'm going to go back to that first paragraph, that first uh, chapter, because the way that that chapter moves, the narrator gets off the plane and he encounters who will be basically his, uh, his guide in Romania, you know, his, his partner, uh, Christian, um, holding up a sign which, which has his mother's name on it, not his. Um, and by the end of the paragraph is when you find out 
that um, that his mother is is buried, you know, that she's underground. And I believe that the final words of that paragraph are sototerra. I'm pretty sure they are. And yeah. and I became, you know, very aware, you know, quite early on in 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 looking at your work that I had better figure out a way to get to your endings because around the ending of your sentences was this resonant white space. And I, I felt like I needed to make to make the translation resonate in the same way by getting to where you got in your sentences, um, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. so, so there, you know, so there's that that terse, quiet prose, which also is intensely imagistic um, and has a great deal, especially for Italian writing, in my view, a great deal of repetition which is I'm, I'm translating another author who every time there's a repetition in, in my translation, she's worried about its appearance because she, she finds that in Italian, the use of repetition uh, has a little bit of a, a, a strange sound to it. And um, I'm, you know, I don't wanna dare to, to say what, how people interpret your style in Italy, but my interpretation is that in some ways um, that repetition creates a greater insistence on music even more than you know than would be a, a, a typical uh, prose work so so my um my tendency in translation anyway is when i want to connect when i want to keep writing these translating these large sentences or these you know these profoundly musical uh, bits of prose, I often will incorporate repetition, which in English is is a common device, you know. Um, with your work, I certainly noticed the repetition and I probably actually ratcheted it up just a little bit. Like it, there's probably more repetition in my translation than is actually there in the original because I was in some ways emphasizing it, if, if that makes sense. Like it becomes, it crystallizes in the English because it's actually slightly exaggerated from, from what's there, you know, in, in the Italian. Um, does that help answer somewhat some of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's very interesting because it's all, it's all about, uh, yeah, sound. And uh, I mean, rhymes are fake repetitions. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. are fake yes. repetitions. They yeah. are repetitions, rhymes, <laughs> uh, yes. basically. Then with a different yes. meaning. Okay, we, we can argue a lot, but that they are repetitions. And, yes. uh, uh, and the way in which uh, um, in a forest uh, uh, there are birds uh, and uh, uh, animals uh, and uh, the sound of the wood and, uh, and so on, uh, talking to each other many times uh, the same way. So that's uh, that's what I want. I want every time I write a book, a novel, or a poem, I want to create a little forest in which there yeah. are sounds, uh, talk, animals talking to each other, maybe with the same sound <laughs> yeah. many times. But then it's a habitat, and there's right. a sound, and, and there's a specific sound of that place. And, right. uh, and people, and life has a sound. And uh, if you uh, sometimes uh, uh, when I walk, uh, for instance, in uh, uh, in Italy, where I like walking, and if I pass by a bar, a cafe, and uh, and, the, and I hear ten times uh, the the sound of the spoon in a coffee cup, you know, uh, and it's so it's such a, a musical thing. And so yeah, but yeah, I, I like writing uh, with uh, with. Uh, um, uh, with, with teaspoons and coffee yes. cups. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, my, my sense of um, when, I, uh, when I read your prose or when I've translated your prose, um, in some ways I don't, of course I read, but I feel like I only truly read it as I'm translating it, you know, as I get every last word into my mouth, then, you know, then, I'm, then I feel like I'm reading it. Um, my sense is that the result of the music of your prose um, and everything together, as you say, but it, it, th there's so much music to it, is that it, it takes away from it as a, as a piece of realism, even though, you know, it's yeah. set in, the, in, in, in present times and it's, you know, and it's about, and has very real emotions. At the same time, 
it kind of move, moves out of the realm of realism because of because it's so stylized, you know, which it, it, it which I love. It, it heightened realism. I I don't know what to say. I mean, you don't have you know you don't have quotes. You don't uh, everything sort of blurs into past and present. Um, but the style of it also, I feel like, uh, you know, creates that creates that effect, that musicality. Um, yeah, and, and I think that we were mentioning uh, uh, Tabuki. Uh, in the, uh, Tabuki, um, he had this uh, kind of style that is uh, um, dreamy, and dreamy is a pure realism. What what's more realistic than a dream? I yeah. mean. The, Sometimes you get out of your dream that you you are completely messed up and you can you are aching and you are really you can be sad for a day and all the things you see are completely real and uh, but and so is realism but at the same time there's this uh, um, I mean there's this power you have to to not accept uh, the version of reality yeah. you are you receive every day from the newspaper you 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 have the right writing to be distracted you have the right uh, to not hear something you have the right to um to be sad hearing uh, uh, something that is uh, joyful or whatever and uh, and that's i i guess it's uh, it's uh, it's taking care of reality in a way also saying okay tree, okay, car, okay, street. I see you. Uh, we can be in a relationship. It's not that you are just a, a stupid car and uh, just to drive. I can be moved by, because your, I don't know, steering wheel is a, uh, is a spot and I see some coffee there and uh, I can talk to you. It is not being <laughs> crazy, it's still realism. But, yeah. but we are in relationship with, with reality. So there's nothing but a relationship or a love affair or a friendship or something bad between us and the things we are around. And so that's, yeah. that's the very point. And in the, in, the, in the translation, just to, to go back uh, to you, you have to be in dreams are completely, they flow very well. I mean, it's not that uh, um, even if... Uh, then when you try in writing, if you try to, if you, uh, try to describe a, a dream, it's always complicated. Usually are the worst thing uh, connected to, uh, now that you can write a dream. But uh, uh, a dream is always very um, smooth, uh, no? And, uh, and, and when, in so translating it, uh, you have to, to dream in your language. And, uh, and that's what, what, what I feel when I read good translations. And, uh, uh, and that's why, uh, as we were saying, maybe in other uh, presentations, uh, uh, the relationship we have between an author and, uh, and the translator uh, goes also through a dialogue. So for instance, you were mentioning repetition, not wanting repetition, the kind of questions at least asked to me, uh, they reveal, they say a lot of her way of uh, translating. So uh, in very often, uh, they are about sound and they are about the uh, words that she would cut because they are, she would change a little bit the meaning because the sound would be, so what's more important sometimes, the sound yes. or, or the meaning and what uh, uh, sits in us, the sound of the meaning or, or the meaning. I would say that uh, it sits in us, the sound, that, that what really creates, provokes the emotion, provokes the emotion is the sound is not the meaning a, of course can't be just a, a, an empty sound no but still. no but but sometimes sometimes you opt for the sound and um we, we'll need to there are a number of questions so i'm, I'm gonna yeah. look through but yeah. just you know a quick example of that that one of your chapters ends with um um i don't remember the exact italian help me out mappa mondo uh, della tua assenza maybe yeah yeah yes. correct which um, which I translated uh, as the world map of your absence, yeah. and Andrea told me, well, actually, it's it's the globe of your, you know, it, it wasn't meant as a world map, and I knew that actually, and there still was time to change it, but I kept world map 
because of the sound map as tied to absence. I mean, it, it felt to me like it needed two syllables, not it, the very end of a chapter needed two syllables, not one globe, you know, world yeah. map of your absence. And that's you know? why in Italian, I, I decided to have Mappa Mondo because it's yes. Mondo. Mondo right. is, the, it, mondo is uh, what, uh, when you say uh, to your mother, you say, sei la più bella del mondo, meaning yeah. a, be, a, a little one says Mondo is, the, is everything, is everywhere. And, Andrea, uh, yeah. Le, yeah. let me look at some of these because I'll feel bad yeah. if, we don't, yeah. if we don't go through some of these. Okay, so we have... Um, uh, Marianne Newman, whom we, we, we must thank, who is, you know, an organizer of this, yeah. and, you know, thank you so much. Um, Andrea, what do you feel when you hear your book reflected back to you in English? Do you discover oh. things you didn't expect? Oh, yeah, I, it's super cool. I think, oh, this is a great American writer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes I, I think that, uh, um, um, that you have an option. There are always... Uh, one phrase uh, Antonio Tabucchi wrote to me when he was uh, it, the last days of his life, uh, where he said to me, there are always, there's always another option in life. Uh, no, and, that, and that's interesting. So when I, I hear and I read this, uh, this translation, first I think, oh my God, so good. And then <laughs> I think that it's great because uh, I can be also someone else. Uh, that's the very reason for which I write every single line. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that I had wanted to ask you, and I, I didn't, you know, want to ask in anything, um, is, I mean, is it weird to you that, that, I mean, this book kind of ended in, when was it published? 2007? Was it 2007? Yeah. So yeah. in a way, you know, uh, as it's translated, it's, you know, it comes back to life. Um, is that weird is that a weird experience or is it a very natural experience for you, you know? No, it's uh, from a certain point of view, very natural uh, because I still recognize myself in the one yeah. who wrote the book and I still recognize myself in the sound of the book in Italian uh, and even in English, I recognize yes, myself. Yes, you do, and, and which is great. That makes me yeah. very happy if you yeah. recognize. Yeah, I recognize myself. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the real, and then it's, uh, I mean, for me, writing is such a long process that uh, it's not so much time. <laughs> the, the, between, much yeah, time. yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can write a poem in, in months, uh, so it's not that, uh, the, so it's, uh, it's just a matter of time. The, the real interesting thing, uh, besides the language, is that uh, I wrote the book uh, in the eyes of a son talking to a mother, uh, and, uh, and now I'm reading the book and talking about the book as a father of a yeah. little one. Uh, yeah. And so, and so, if uh, the first does time, you, every, does it hold every up, time, what? does it hold up? You uh, know, it, it, it just does that make sense? What, what, what do you mean by hold up? I mean that you know, as a father looking at it, do you find that the son, in some ways, you know made some made some errors in assessing no 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 it's just that uh, uh it's much that from a certain point of view um i uh when I, I i wrote it i just focused on on myself uh and so i was just looking at the mother and uh without because the one who is saying i is the little one even if that when he when he writes is a uh, in his 30s probably. Uh, whereas now I'm also looking at him because uh, this little one, uh, I can feel more, uh, let's say like that, I can feel more his pain. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can feel more his pain, even if it's, 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 uh, can be absurd, can be crazy because uh, I should feel more my pain if I write uh, as myself. Whereas uh, uh, you can feel the pain of your son is uh, more important and bigger in the, than yours. So, yeah. so it's just a, a very interesting perspective. It's, a, yeah. it's just that it, for me, it's like a new book. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think actually that we we need to end. Am I right? I think it's it's time to. Okay. Okay. Well, um, thank you for. I mean, I'm so delighted.
that I was able to translate this book. It's been a joy, you know. I'm sad it's done, truthfully, you know. I really, really enjoyed working on it. And I mean, I love that it's here, but it also makes me a little sad that I don't yeah. get to work on it anymore. <laughs> that's why that's why I keep writing to yeah. to feed you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. So, and thanks, thanks for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye bye. Hello and welcome to our poetry book launch and discussion. My name is Nancy Naomi Carlson, and I'm a Maryland-based poet and translator of Cargo Hold of Stars, Kuriki, authored by Carl Tahabili, who is joining me from France and who I'm meeting for the first time ever, along with Naveen Kishore, our publisher, who I've met only one time before and who is joining us from Calcutta, India. I'm very grateful to Marianne Newman for including us in this year's St. Jordi. And I'm grateful to you, the audience, who we couldn't do this without you. So the first part of our event in that part, we'll have a conversation about the book and how it came into this world and why it's an important book and what attracted um, Nadine's interest in Seagull in publishing it. And then we will spend the second half with a reading from the book bilingual reading in places and all of us will be joining in in the reading. So here we go. And I'm going to start with the um, introductions. So Paul Torabuli is a Franco-Mauritian poet, theorist and writer who obtained his PhD at Université Lumière Lyon II. He has authored 26 books and elaborated a humanism of diversity and the choral poetics in his exploration of indenture and migrations. He has collaborated with UNESCO on the Silk Roots and directed a film on the Maritime Spice and Silk Roots, which won the Golden Award at the Media Film Festival of Cairo in 2000. He is an honorary patron of the Amina Gafur Institute of Indenture in the UK, and he's currently writing a novel and a poetry collection. Naveen Kishore, established Seagull Books in 1982, publish, publishing literature, including poetry, serious fiction, and nonfiction. Kishore is a photographer who has extensively documented female impersonators from Manipuri, Bengali, and Punjabi theater practices. He is also the recipient of the Goethe Medal and the Chevalier Ordre des Arts et des Lettres. Kishore lives and works in Calcutta, and he's at seagullbooks.org. So I'm going to start by asking Carl to contextualize Cal d'Etoile Coulitude for us. First, I would like to say hello to everyone and thank the organizers for inviting me, for inviting us, because as you said earlier, we are a trio of Trois Mousquetaires, the Three Mousquetaires, no? <laughs> so it's going to be very warm, I hope, poetry round. And um, well, to come back to your question, I had written some 10 poetry collections before writing Cal d'Etoile Coulitude, which is a French title of Cargo Hall of Stars. You definitely translated, Nancy. Um, it was uh, out of a personal quest that uh, there was something lacking in my own personal history. And uh, when I started investigating, I thought that indenture was a main page of this past. So in, it was in 1989. Uh, people were celebrating the bicentenary of the French Revolution, and I wanted to write my history uh, from the global south. So this is how it started. And can you tell us a little bit about how the book is organized? Well, the book is organized in three parts. It took me some time to find this structure uh, because I wanted to question the idea of a linear chronology in history. And uh, you can read the book in French and in English as well, both ways. 
from beginning to end and end to the beginning. And the pivotal book is the book of the voyage. Um, this enables me to posit something which is a kind of revoicing the archives, but at the same, same time go to something like an initiation when you're traveling. It is a fundamental voyage of any person who even now goes by plane or, you know, walk uh, to under the, under the place. Uh, who is the person who lives? Who is the person who is traveling? Who is the person who arrives? Is he or she the same person? This is also one of the funda fundamental aspects of, of this uh, tri tri uh, trilogy in French. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also, can you tell us about the word coulitude? Um, I think we, we, we used to all talk about the coolies in a derogative fashion as these indentured workers who were coming from all over, especially India and China, and they came to uh, Mauritius. And then they, this was at the turn of the century, and then they stayed in Mauritius working the sugarcane plantations, or they were shipped out in horrible, tragic transoceanic voyages to the colonies where they worked the fields. But then you've taken that term and you've done something with that. Yes, when I was speaking about the voiceless of the archives, I think the voiceless among the voices were the coolies. They were downtrodden people. History had marginalized them further than the indentured, what we call the indentured persons. And they, it was a way of questioning the colonial the slur, the insult. You know, when somebody treats you in some part of the world, in some context as a coolie, it can be derogatory. So I wanted to give a new definition to the word by uh, using the suffix tude, uh, giving a dimension, a new dimension to this voiceless person, the coolie, opening him or her to you, a, a whole range of ideas, theorizing, cultures, because the coolie carries not only goods, but ideas, books, and cultures. This is the way I wanted to go beyond something that was offensive and give new uh, uh, traction to the world fully. And then you also took that wonderful term and you applied it to the poetics of, of uh, the, the, from the coral, coral in, the, in the ocean and a poetics and your language is all these millions of voices coming at you with neologisms and wordplay and, and uh, rhymes and alliteration, which by the way, was not the easiest to translate but that's okay <laughs> uh, to get that effect. Can you talk a little bit about that poetic? Yes, well, you explained it. this idea of the sea as a central element, which is the, I was speaking of the pivotal book of Cargo Hall of Stars. The sea as a space of dissolution of identities and reinvention of identities, but with all the mix of languages, because I was born, uh, on a small island uh, uh, in this, let us say, the, this, one of the centers of the Indian Ocean. And uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, some 12 languages there. And uh, uh, my, one of my, let us say, my mother tongue was, uh, is Creole, you see, which is made of uh, Portuguese uh, syntax, um, French language, some Indian like Bochpuri and so on. So I could not write without have, having all these noises, you know, deep in me. And the, the poetics is a vision of the world. My vision is trans-archipelagic, trans-oceanic, because my father came from Trinidad, so from the Atlantic, I was born in the Indian Ocean. I cannot envisage uh, reclaiming uh, indenture as a human experience without connecting with all these humanities. Thank you. And now let's turn to our publisher, who was very gracious and excited when I proposed this idea. And he's going to talk to us in his own way about <laughs> his uh, 
uh, what drew him to the book and the idea? Well, I think, I mean, Carl has put it very well, in fact, better than I would, but with me, as you know, we, it's, it's, it's always the intuitive that first strikes me. So when you present me with a text uh, or a sampler of the text, I tend to get into it with a kind of gut instinct, which I think a lot of uh, publishers do that. So there's nothing unique about that bit. But what was interesting here was what Carl very beautifully put, this business, the combination of voicelessness, the different languages across cultures. It was, I'd never seen him. I mean, till today, I, I didn't have a sense of what he looked like. And yet I had a sense of what he looked like because of all the sounds, the music, the words that came through in the way that you had translated it, which was quite unique because I don't do French. So I wrote a little text as a kind of tribute for both of you, both of you who are poets, translator, poet, different languages, Carl's own background, crisscrossing cultures. And this is what I wrote. And I hope that this will give you the real reason as to why my intuition worked like that. In every piece of writing that works, that makes engrossed reading, involves one, makes one think, feel a quickening of the senses in physical terms, akin to those pimples we call ooze. There is a moment of extreme compatibility with the text, a sensation of oneness, recognition of having returned to something long dormant, not forgotten entirely, but hidden, perhaps awaiting this precise moment to reveal its presence, a moment where we feel a gust of cold blowing towards us like the approach of dawn on the horizon of our being. Some call it deja vu. I call it the music of the senses. And Carl is all about music. Thank you. Wow. Compatibility with the text and returning to a oneness and dawn on the horizon of our beings. And Naveen also is a poet, as you can tell. <laughs> Thank you. Backstage poet. <laughs> but yes. So we... Um, I, I said I'd say a word about how Colin and I met, and in actuality, we met in, in an anthology, a wonderful anthology of Francophone writers, Patrick Williamson, and that's where I met um, Abdou Amon Waberi as well, in that wonderful anthology. And Alain yes. Mabancou is in that anthology, but I met him a different way, so all oh, roads lead to... Um, so I, I emailed, I Facebooked Carl and I Facebooked Abdu and Carl's message went into my other. So I didn't see it for six months. And by then Abdu and I were merrily going and uh, working on the book. And he was located uh, three Metro stops Abdu away from me in DC. Uh, little did I know that. So mm -hmm. finally, we finished that and, and then I, I saw Carl's message and then we've been working on this for several years and he's been very patient when I, I pop up again and say, okay, now I'm, 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 I'm focused, I'm working on it and, uh, and we finally have our book. So we're gonna start with our reading and um, I'm gonna start with one that shows you a little bit and hopefully you'll hear it in my words of some of the things that I had to deal with, with um, sounds and alliteration and music and play. And I sound mapped these texts to see where the alliteration was, where the assonance was. And then I couldn't, of course, get the, the same sounds because some don't exist in, in English. The, the vowels, the on and the on and the an, and um, I couldn't get the exact placement in the line of it, but my goal was to honor the music in the book and the wordplay, because I think that underscores the very seriousness of these themes. We're, we're talking about tragic themes. We're talking about people's lives tricked into indenture, treated horribly, thrown into the cargo hold of a ship where, as Carl says, they can see the, the stars there. That's where the, the stars come in. And 
even the wordplay Carl, Carl's name is the same sound as Carl, which is cargo hold. So he plays on that. Plus every word for Carl has three overlapping meanings and coming into play. And so I couldn't possibly replicate that brilliance, but I could try to get a taste of what was going on into the English. She did very well. Thank oh, you. thank you. Oh, yes. You wrote something which is, which teaches me my own poetry. <laughs> I'm honored. Thank you. So, Carl's poems usually don't have titles, so we're just going to jump into them. Language has coolied me for conception, word of my spit. Pure cascade, mixed cascade, casket bound. Pure water pays no attention to bloodlines. Cast, clasped, cloned, guessing at what my next roots will be is my true harvest of maritime dreams. And in the book, that poem is just at the bottom there. I did write in the book, I'm sorry. And then there are three voices that appear on that page. These voices coming out at you. So at this point, Carl's going to read in French to the Varang, and then I'll follow it with English. And a Varang, a Varang, oh, there's a glossary here that Carl was kind enough to, to work with us and me as we worked and tried to get meanings of, of, sometimes the glossary is one of the hardest parts because you need to be able to have a, a, a succinct, explanation of what a word is. So barang is a French word as well as a Hindi word that means veranda. It also refers to the floor plate of a boat situated perpendicularly over the keel. I think I only translate it as veranda. <laughs> Call Thank the you. French, please. Thank you. So in French, sur la varangue, Ma langue cherche une mangue. Petite lune sur ma de une me harangue. Raconte ma traversée coulissante. Au oh, coulis, pas lent, poulie. Dis lumière pour vérité. Sur la varangue, la mangue sous ma langue, je manque à l'appel. Mon cœur tangue. Comment guider le gouvernail et donner ta chair à toute rive, à des rives, à tes rêves Ô oh, coulis, parlant coulis, réduisez la voilure, cassez le vent de mémoire effilochée par cœur arraché. Je connais ce chant, je connais l'Odyssée. Ô oh, coulis, such rich, rich sounds there. On the varong, my tongue seeks a mango, and I'm harangued by a small topmast moon. Tell the tale of my curried crossing. O oh, capstan, coolie, pulley, coolie, say light for truth. On the varong, mango under my tongue. I miss roll call, my heart reels. How to steer the rudder and give your flesh to all shores, all drifts, to your dream. Oh, coolie, capstan, coolie. Reef the sails, break the wind of memories frayed by uprooted hearts. I know this song, I know the odyssey. Oh, creaking, capstan, coolie. And Carl is going to read two poems in English. Om oh, Acacia, Aurora, heave ho, my rickety boat. Halali, halala, I crunch areca nuts. Om oh, Acacia, Aurora. I chew my only tobacco chow. 
I wrap my better leaf. Alalila, alalila. My belly bloated with lime to erode the legends of salt. Om, acacia, aurora. My spit thick as blood. Malaglava. My katishu port. I attract the Red Sea to your burning bush. I neglect to touch the wavering golden sands. Don't swallow man. Swallow, take the rain and give back sun. Malaba post malaria. Malaba pre maloya. I found the sky as I held my breath. A bird cut across the night with that thunderous sound of a broken, frail wave. Mm. Hear your voice reading these in English. It's quite a first experience for me. Thank you. And Naveen, you don't get to just sit there and listen. You get to do some work <laughs> here too. So you're going to be reading the next three poems. Define me, please. What's a coolie? One with a noose round his neck, denied the deck's cool lee side. I am Laskar Malabar. Madras tamarind from bazaars, Telugu with tell tales for you. Cruel Marathi mother or Chamar. Whichever you like, I'm an Indian black. Guinea pig from Port Louis to Port of Spain to replace mighty Zanzibar slaves. For memory, my only lingoti, a loincloth, my language purloined by the sea. If you recognize me, please call me proxy slave, straw man or stand in, kapok from fields or ocean vertebrae but know that my saber of blood has uprooted me to the core. Ship's hold is my flesh of space. Ship's hold is my flesh of space. From the point of view of the virgin word, my skin is to blame. Ship's hold is my cry of the human race Ship's hold is my memory, full-faced, a taste of sand on the peephole. Every cry takes my scalp. And if I choose a vessel with strange accents of the sea, it's because I want to be at home everywhere else, even in words most removed from my borrowed soul. The doors of the world have been knocked down for me by a current of blood and a drift of flesh navigation. Kuli, because my lost memory chooses its roots in my truths, but I only seize this tongue insofar as it adopts me to no longer be blocked from the word. And at the threshold of French, I vary the way, I knock in a different way on vowels and consonants. First and foremost, I love words, even more than my wounds. And I speak my French tongue to point out my home port on the map of my discoveries. Marriage between my oceans and continents at last. Thank you. What a privilege to hear both of you reading and having a touch of that filmmaker and behind the scenes in you, superb readers. Thank you, thank you much. You're welcome, Navi. So our, our last segment, we'll have, hopefully we'll keep track of time, three segments and Kyle will be reading the first two and I'll read the last one, which is the last poem in the book. You from Goa, Pondicherry, Chandenago, Konkan, Delhi, Surat, London, Shanghai, Lorient, Saint Malo. Mix of people from all ships 
who brought me towards another me. My cargo hall of stars is my nautical chart, my space, my vision of the ocean, all of us crossed, though we did not see the stars from the same point of view, from gangway or dark. No voice but mine told me my part of the journey. In saying Kuli, I'm also speaking of every voyager barred from a ship's registry. All who have embarked for horizons of dreams, whatever the ship they boarded or had to board. For when besting the sea to be born on another shore, sailors on one-way trips like to plunge back into their stories, legends and dreams. The years before memories were formed. Do I read the, the, the next text? Yes, the Coolitude Worker Bees. Coolitude. Coolitude. Worker Bees of the Colonies. You were merchandise and we merchandising or vice versa. Coolitude. Because my shows teem with new traces of memory. And if African gestures came to our hands as we cut the cane, the cracking and dancing of fingers remain ours, used to the tabla, often attuned to the ravans, great cry of hearts adrift. Coolitude. Because I am Creole by my rigging. Indian by my mast, European by my spar, Mauritian by my quest, and French by my exile. I will always be elsewhere, only within myself, because I can only imagine my native land. My native lands? In our tongues, we are the fertile frontier of codes, <clears throat> to hear a word among the exchanges of masters and slaves. It is why my true mother tongue is poetry. Why my only native land is the earth. That's why I'm ready to quell all border quarrels so all may see our star and share our common heritage, flesh and blood. Coolitude, not just for the memory, the past of our first crossing of earth, but also for those human values amassed by the island from encounters with sons and daughters of Africa, India, China, and the Occident. My only dreamt homeland, the great brotherhood of humanity, of reconciliation. For this part of ourselves that we must compose in the light of day with an eye to human destiny waiting to be fulfilled. Once again, I propose we be porters of futures, worker bees of worlds, sowers of languages, builders of bridges connecting continents poised for a healthy sharing. Know yourself so you can build better together. For memory regained is a great plan for the future. What other truth can there be that carries the weight of a word handed down from the ship's lookout post? Okay. And that concludes our reading, our event, our talking, and we're in the time limit. So I want to thank both Kal and Naveen for joining me here. And thank you, thank you audience, for being here too.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to hear about Boat People by Mayra Santos Febres. My name is Charlotte Whittle, and I'm a literary translator from Spanish, and I'm also the uh, editor at um, Cardboard House Press, which is a bilingual press based in New York and Los Angeles, um, where we publish uh, Latin American poetry and Spanish poetry in uh, English and Spanish in bilingual editions. I'm absolutely delighted to, to be joined this afternoon by Vanessa Perez Rosario, um, who is the translator of Mera Santos Febres, Boat People. Uh, let me introduce her. Uh, Vanessa Perez Rosario is a translator and professor of English at Queens College, City University of New York, where she teaches US, US Latinx and Caribbean literatures and cultures. Her translations have appeared in The Nation and Essex Salon. She is the author of Becoming Julia Bu Julia de Burgos, The Making of a Puerto Rican Icon, which will be published in, Sp in a Spanish edition in 2021. She is the editor of Hisp Hispanic Caribbean Literature of Migration, Narratives of Displacement, published by Paul in 2010. And she is currently editing a bilingual anthology of their collected writings of Julia de Burgos. Vanessa, thanks so much for joining us. We're thrilled to be publishing Boat People in your translation. And I'd like to invite you to give a, a brief introduction to the book and um, you know, dive into uh, reading some poems for us. Charlotte, thank you so much for the introduction and for your interest in this project. Um, I started working on it uh, several years ago and was really interested in it. I'm, I'm primarily a literary critic and mm -hmm very interested in it because of my interest in um, migration, migration mm -hmm. and literature and thinking about representations of migration in literature and unauthorized migration in literature. And one of the things that was fascinating to me about this book is that, that the book imagines, Mayra Santos Ferres, the author imagines migration in this book um, from the Caribbean to the to the U.S. or from other parts of the Caribbean to Puerto Rico first, mm -hmm. and then often from Puerto Rico to um, the United States, and so it really activated my imagination about how we might think about the Caribbean and the Caribbean Sea as another border, as another mm -hmm. kind of border space. We focus so much on the border between the United States and Mexico, and there's so much of a focus on migration to that border. And this book asks us to think about this other migration um, in the Caribbean to the United States. So that really captured my attention. And I started working on translations of the book and, and I'm thrilled to, that it will be in print very soon. So, soon, very soon, yeah. Yes, so, so I'm, I'm very grateful to um, Cardboard House Press and to you in particular, because I know you took an interest in this project when I started translating um, and I shared some, some of the work, you took an interest in it right away. So I, I yeah. was... Um, uh, yeah, just very grateful to you for that interest and and your um, your keen um, sense of of your keen sense as an editor uh, as well. So I'm I'm just thrilled to be to to have this book coming out with Cardboard House Press. That's great. It's a really special book, and we're we're about to hear why. <laughs> okay, so I will. Yeah. Go ahead and share some of the share Absolutely. some of the poems. Yes, yeah, great. And uh, yeah, I mean, another thing about it, of course, is that the the even the Spanish edition had gone out of print. Right, the book was was published initially in two thousand five, mm -hmm. and um, this this bilingual edition coming out with Cardboard House Press will bring it back into circulation in a way that it hasn't been for for a few years. So um, that's exciting too. And just uh, to just to uh, follow up on that, it was published in Puerto Rico, right? But it, was it published anywhere else in Latin America that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. No, I, it was published with, I believe it was Ediciones Callejón, which is a great yeah. a publisher in in Puerto Rico. They 
publish really um, wonderful works of literature and literary criticism. Um, but to my knowledge, it was not published elsewhere. And so then once that uh, they sold out of, of their copies, they didn't reprint the book. I'm not, I don't know why, but um, it's, it's exciting to know that it'll be back in circulation soon. Fantastic. All right. So I will read a few poems. I'll read in Spanish first and then in English. I'll read the, the original first and then read in English. And um, and I should just note that the, the poems don't have titles. So I will just read the number and then um, uh, you can identify the poems that way. I'm gonna start with number 15. Sin documentos de nombres ya cambiados, no se llaman como flotan, impostores, no son para dar de comer a gaviotas, y ahí están, reventados por la costa del islote, de tripa abierta tan azul que brilla como peces contra el sol, y no son ni para comerse los pelícanos, y no son para beberse el agua de los mangles, pero díselos tú a ellos, en Patua, en Tigre, en Congo o en Caribe, rebotando de susto contra yolas pescadores, enredándose de greñas en las hélices y flotando por ahí tan campana, tan nísperos de agua reventándose por dentro. Son así, sin sus labios, una sonrisa de encías donde crece el coral. Son un llanto muerto por ahí, espantando al que más. Y en la yola... El silencio sueña con ahogados legendarios que alan a donde tienen su palenque. A ver, díselos tú. La sal no se hizo para esto. Un cuerpo sobre la arena no debe estar así, tan desprevisto de su piel. A ver, díselos. A ellos, en Patua, en Tigre, en Congo o en Caribe. El hambre no es para costar tanto. Y ahora en inglés, número 15, number 15. Without papers, identities borrowed, floating under forged names, imposters. They're not meant to be food for seagulls, and yet there they are, burst open on the islet's shore. Guts so blue, glistening like fish against the sun. And they're not even meant to be eaten by pelicans or swallowed by mangrove water. But you go tell them, tell them in Patua, in Tigre, in Congo, or in Caribe. Ricocheting in fear against fishing yawls, hair tangled in propellers, and floating around like a bell, like watery naseberries bursting inside, like this, lipless, a gummy smile where coral grows, a dead cry out there, raising fear in most, and in the yawl, Silence dreams of the legendary drowned who lure them to their palenque. So tell them, salt was not made for this. A body on the sand shouldn't be so bereft of its skin. So you tell them, tell them in Patua, in Tigre, in Congo or in Caribe. Hunger shouldn't cost so much. Um, I am going to read next. I'm going to continue, I think, just with number 16. Número 16. ¿Cómo es la ciudad de tu muerte, mulato? Dime, ¿por dónde pisas a la hora del barlovento de metal? ¿Cómo barres las olas de la calle para que no te vengan a dejar frente a tu casa basura de mar? Las latas que recogerás allí en tu muerte y las que venderás por libra para centavo. ¿Qué carro coges? ¿Qué Chevy del 78 y con problemas de ignación? ¿Cuántas sopas de alga con pelícanos habrás hecho para llevarle a la vecina? ¿Y cuántas rumbas, socas, bachatas y danzones oirás por la radio en burbujitas? Esperando que pase el submarino o el atún que va hacia el canal de Panamá. ¿Cómo limpias casas de indocumentados que se han hecho ricos ahuyentando pescadores? Dime, mulata, 
¿Cómo es la ciudad de Barsas por donde transitas con tus ojos desnudos al fin de tanta costa? Number 16. How is the city of your death, Mulata? Tell me, where do your feet tread at the windward hour of metal? How do you sweep waves from the street so they'll not leave sea refuse at your doorstep? Cans you'll collect there in your death and the ones you'll sell for a penny by the pound. What car do you take? What Chevy 78 with ignition problems? How many pelican seaweed soups will you have made to feed your neighbor? And how many rumbas, socas, bachatas, and danzones will you hear bubbles on the radio? While you wait for a submarine or a tuna bound for the Panama Canal, how to clean houses of the undocumented who've grown rich by shooing away fishermen. Tell me, Mulata, how is the city of rafts you float through, your eyes stripped at last of innumerable shores? Voy a leer ahora. Um, Voy a seguir con el 17 y después eh, con el número 19. Ahora 17. Llegas a la ciudad donde te pierdes, cambiado, más flaco, más lleno de cristal tu hoja. Tu, perdón. Más lleno de cristal tu ojo. Llegas más acostumbrado a la muerte, a los ruidos de motores, al ruido al infinito ruido de los carros que parecen tripa de mar. Llegas más acostumbrado a insultar, con otro recorte, con otros artefactos bajo el brazo. No ves los letreros, no hacen falta. Llegas acostumbrado a andar perdido y sin casa, para seguir trabajando en lo mismo, más en la defensa de un rollito de papeles que mandas. Al antiguo hogar, lleva, llegas invisible, Hace meses que no te miras al espejo. Hace meses que, que caminas sin afeitar por la ciudad anónima de Brea es tu alimento. Llegas y juras que estás en el fondo del mar. No puedes creer lo que respiras. Allá lejos, un cachito de esquina con bodega te recuerda aromas enmendados. Llegas. Te tocas la verga en una esquina por aquello de comprobar que llegaste con ella puesta, que no la olvidaste en el transporte. Llegas con otro nombre, con otras residencias envueltas en un papelito verde. Buscas la playa por instinto, estás de espalda al mar. Hueles una alcantarilla que te recuerda la proa de una yola y sabes que andas de paso, más raudo que antes, azaroso. Llegas y sabes que estás a punto de irte y que nunca te moverás del hogar. Ahora, number 17. You arrive in the city where you are lost, changed, thinner, more glassy-eyed. You become more accustomed to, to death to engine noises, to clamor, to the infinite din of cars like sea innards. You become more accustomed to insult with a different hairstyle and other belongings in tow. You don't see the signs, there's no need. You get used to wandering lost without a home to keep working at the same place, more in defense of small wads of green paper to send to your old home. You arrive invisible, months of not looking in the mirror, months of walking without a shave. In the anonymous city, nourished by tar, you arrive and swear you're in the ocean's deep. You cannot believe what you breathe. Far away, a little corner bodega, reminiscent of healing aromas. You arrive, you touch your cock on a corner to confirm it made the journey, not left behind in transport. You arrive with another name and other residences wrapped up in green paper, searching for the shore by instinct, you're back to the sea. Sewer smells evoke the bow of a yaw, and, you're, and you know you're just passing through, 
quicker than before, full of dread, you arrive and know you'll soon leave and never move again. Should I stop there? Should I read one more? Let's have one more, yeah. Let's, Let's do one, one more. more. Okay. Yeah. Not, I, I was kind of saving number 19 for the last one to read because it's such a, a powerful point, poem. Yep. So uh, I'll close with this one. Uh, número 19. Nueve han tira, tirados en hilera, en la arena con los párpados violetas. Nueve van y un día tuvieron hasta historia de chiquitos. Y después fueron nueve, buscando una ciudad donde comprar todo lo que anuncian los cristales, lo que anuncian las tripas contra el agua. Lejos, los guardacostas de todas formas los arrestaron. Les ataron las manos a la espalda. Los extraditaron de su guardarraya azul y amarilla porque andaban sin papeles flotando por ahí, tirados en la arena. Los retrató un reportero sollozando de susto, tanta carne al desperdicio del mar. Nueve, se preguntó, y también preguntó por sus almuerzos y lloraba nueve, que una vez fueron nueve sueños de otra costa y de cositas, de esas cositas de esas cositas que se compran con dinero. Number 19. Nine goes strewn in a row on the sand with violet eyelids, nine go, and once they even had a children's story. And then there were nine. In search of a city where they could buy, everything in the window displays, what guts say when, the, when they plunge in waters. Far flung, the Coast Guard arrested them anyway, tied their hands at their backs, extradited from their border blue and yellow because they had no papers and were floating around strewn on the sand. Photographed by a reporter sobbing in fright, so many bodies, sea litter. Nine, he asked himself and asked too about their lunch and cried for, for nine who once were, nine dreams of a foreign shore and of little things, those little things money can buy. I'll stop. There. Oh. Thank you so much. I was um, I was really struck by um, what you were saying about the this idea of the Caribbean as another border. I think as uh, you you gestured toward the the fact that in in the U.S. in, in the collective imagination in the U.S. you know the, the border is this uh, parched desert area you know between. Mexico and the United States. And there's, there's quite a fixed image of that that we have in, in our imagination. But we don't tend to think about the, the, the territories that migrants have often traversed before they reach what we think of as the border, right? I mean, I was thinking, I was, I was reading recently about Haitian immigrants you know, who are stuck in Tijuana waiting to, you know, wait, waiting to cross into, you know, try to cross into the United States. And I was thinking, well, what, are, we know, we, we don't hear anything about that journey, you know? And I think, you know, the, and the, um, the, the journeys made by Central American migrants across Mexico, or, which are just terribly, you know, extremely dangerous and, you know, um, uh, risky are, are journeys that are only just sort of starting to reach our consciousness, you know, ever since the 2014, 15, you know, um, Central American migrant you know, crisis, which is which is ongoing, right? So, um, and uh, Mayra Santos Febres um, takes as her subject these these journeys that are that are happening, you know, that have that have the U.S. Uh, as their destination. Probably, she suggests, right? Although it's not necessarily ex explicit, but they're but they're happening in these these other territories that aren't that aren't part of our collective awareness. And I'm struck by the way uh, she in, in these poems makes the water uh, and makes that border territory into a place, into a location, you know, mm. in itself, right? It's this whole, it's this whole world unto itself where there's a city on the, on the, on the seabed and there are the, there are characters, and there's you know there's the sort of there's the uh, floor, sort of ocean flora and fauna, and it is it's as if this place, which is a a, 
a place of passage is also a location and 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 becomes a destiny in yeah. itself, right? Yeah, I think that's really that's really um, a great way to think about it and and to talk about it because if you think about even, I mean, you're absolutely right, right? These poems, the there's this this um, illegal city at the bottom of the sea that is is in itself a, 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 um, a place where you see so many of these migrants uh, in these poems end up um, becoming, forming part of this city, mm -hmm. the city of this illegal city or undocumented city as she refers to it at, at different times. But um, as I was listening to you talk, I mean, I think that thinking about the border as, um, as a location, not just a, a place that one passes through reminds me in some sense of, of, of other literary works like mm -hmm. Gloria Saldua, for example, right? I mean, the border there, right? border, borderland La Frontera, the border there is a place that she inhabits. Although most of us think about the border as just a place that one um, wants to cross, wants mm -hmm. to get to the other side. And she says, no, this was my home. And, and we see that happening a little bit in Maida's work as well. Um, so I think that there are those parallels that are interesting to think about. Um, and, and I think in some way, the sea here is what unifies, the sea as, a, as the border as, is what unifies all of the, the whole Caribbean archipelago, right? So it unifies, the various um, islands. Uh, so it is a border that separates us, but it, but it also is a border that it, it's, it, we can imagine the water as something that connects the various islands. It's almost like the, the sea is a kind of a character in these poems, would you say? It's, yes. Um, and this is obviously a, a space of danger right, where people are un un undertaking these um, the high risk journeys. But there's all, the, it, it also, uh, this sort of space of water also seems to have a kind of a nurturing quality to it. Can you talk a little bit about that, that duality? Sure, that's, I mean, I think it's one of the most um, wonderful images in the, in the collection is the way that the water, by the, especially by the end of the, the collection. I didn't read the, la the final poem because um, that might be something better left to uh, readers to read on their own. It's the, long, yeah. it, it's the culminating poem. Um, yeah. And the collection in some way works like that, right? It, it, there seems to be a progression here till you get to that final poem where, where the, the sea who appears to be personified throughout really emerges as a character in this final, in the final poem and, um, and is thought of as a woman in the poem, bring kind of motherly maternal, qualities, yes. maternal qualities, but also a frightening, kind of a frightening space, right? A place of danger, a, a place of, um, uh, yeah, uh, just just violent. That can be a, a violent, kind of dangerous, treacherous mm -hmm. space, um, but also a place um, that's comforting and soothing to the migrants. So it's it's interesting. It, it merges um, as a very powerful image at the end of of the of the poem uh, of the collection, and we can think of it as I think I, I write about this a little bit in the in the translator's note, but we can think of the poems as elegies, right? elegies yeah. to these migrants, and and the sea emerges as that enduring natural um, figure uh, that that endures beyond um, human mortality. Right. There's something uh, sort of mythical about about the sea as a character. It's almost like she's a goddess or something. And I, there is this. Um, there are a couple of uh, allusions to um, Greek, 
Greek geography, right? Yeah. And that, those sort of there, there are some allusions to the ancient world slipped in there, which uh, I thought was really fascinating as I was reading. And it just occurred to me uh, now as I was talking about um, these uh, migratory routes that, you know, uh, Santos Febres references the Aegean Sea. And this is a book that was published, you know, before the um, the mi migrant crisis that re the refugee crisis that resulted, you know, largely from from the, the civil war in Syria, right, where you have um, groups of uh, North African and uh, Middle Eastern uh, refugees crossing the Aegean Sea on these horrendously dangerous rafts, right? So it it's like it's sort of with the passage of time, the 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 uh, the collection has sort of gained a new layer of of resonance, which is fascinating to me. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I, I one can imagine that the motivation for the book, at least um, uh, perhaps the seed for for it, and she has said this herself, mm -hmm. is or was Dom Dominican migration to Puerto Rico. There's right. a lot of Dominican migration to Puerto Rico, or there was. Um, even when I was a child growing up in Puerto Rico, that's part of, I, I think what attracted me to the, to the book among many other things is that, um, I lived on the West coast of the Island and that was mostly where the migrants would, that's the, the border that's closest to the Dominican Republic. So, um, Yes, but there, I, I can imagine that this was the the origins of the book. Um, but now, as we as we see the way that there are these migration crises around the world, um, it has def definitely gained in in significance. I think it feels it feels very timely. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. It's very current. I um I wanted to touch on. The, the representation of the migrants themselves, um, this subjects who were, who were undertaking these journeys, because they are, rep they are represented occasionally as whole, right? But, but more often they are represented in, by their sort of component parts. Um, and that is, um, a, a really interesting rhetorical strategy that, that Santos Febres employs. I, I wonder if you could expand a little bit on, on that, you know, um, on the presence of all of these body parts that are sort of yeah. floating around in these poems. Yeah, I mean, it's disconcerting, right? Yeah. When you first read the poetry, there there are body pieces and body fragments everywhere. And I think, you know, one of the ways to read that or to try to make sense of it is, is as readers, it's what we do. We try to make sense of, of the things that we read and, and one can't really piece these uh, bodies back together. We can't, we, can't, um, we can't reconstruct these bodies into, um, hum into humans, right? Into, into um, people that we would, be able that are recognizable to us and and I think what she's doing there what her strategy is as, as a writer is to to confront the reader with the idea that um, in some sense these stories are not knowable these are people who've disappeared um, we don't know how many we don't know how many of them have mm -hmm. have dropped at, at the bottom of the ocean we don't um, we won't know their stories. They don't make it across the border to tell their stories. And so we're left with this sort of incoherence of um, an inability to fully know what's, uh, to know this experience. It's an experience that we can't know. So it can't fully be represented in a work of literature. Right, right. Um, thank, thank you. Very much. We are coming. This has absolutely flown by. We're coming yes. up uh, to our to our last minute, and I was wondering if you would like to um, close by reading the first poem. Sure, absolutely. You know, to um, sort of uh, uh, 
remind us and also hopefully, you know, whet our readers' appetites for, for more. Um, uh, Boat, Boat People will be published by Cardboard House Press in just a few weeks and it can be pre-ordered from our website or from small press distribution. Um, yeah, so, so, so thank you so much, Vanessa, for, um, for this really rich conversation. Thank about, you. About yeah. Boat People and yeah, could please, please uh, close us I'll out close. with the, the first poem, yeah. I'll close with the first, with the first poem. Boat People, oh, sorry, I need these. Boat People. Carnes trituradas, tiburón de onyx, pelícano en su salsa, en su volatín de alas y cristal, cactus bebido, muérdago de espinos, cuerpos hinchados como moluscos, buscando en el fondo del mar, el cielo de la boca que es su vientre. Boat people, mangled bodies, onyx shark, a pelican in their sauce, in their winged and crystal kite, Cactus drink, thorny mistletoe, bodies swollen like mollusks searching in the, in the ocean's deep for the sky of the mouth that's their belly. Thank you so much. That's a beautiful place to end. Thank you for the amazing translations and for introducing us all to Mara Santos Febres' work. Um, I know that uh, some of her novels have been translated, but this is the first book of her poems to, to have been translated. And who knows, maybe there'll be more. Yes. <laughs> yep. Oh, um, we actually have, um, we do have some questions. You said we could, we have time, right, uh, Ignacio? Okay, um, so we do have a, we. Um, we Excellent. have a question, just a, a general question. Could you tell us a little more about Mayra Santos Febres and, the, and some of her other work? Sure, absolutely. So mm -hmm. um, I, I can pick up right where you left off because yeah. her first um, publication was a collection of poetry and mm -hmm. she's always considered herself a poet. She's published a number of, of poems, excuse me, a number of collections of poetry, but they haven't been translated. She's also um, a novelist and is perhaps most well known for her yeah. novels. And um, Sirena, Sirena Selena Vestida de Pena is perhaps one of her most well known. Uh, Cualquier Miércoles Soy Tuya. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one of the things that we, we can say about her poetry, uh, her work, her poetry, and her, her fiction is that she does often write about figures who are kind of outcast or on the margins of, of society. So um, this book is no, Boat People is no different in that sense. Absolutely. And the first novel that you mentioned, I believe is translated into English, right? Do you know, do you know what- Sirena, Selena, I don't know what the translation in English is though. Sirena, Selena, Vestida de Pena. It is translated into English and Cualquier Miércoles Soy Tuya is also translated into it. Okay. Any Wednesday I'm yours or something like that. That one I'm familiar with in English. Um, Sirena Selena, the first part of the, of the title in English is the same. Yeah, Sirena Selena. Okay. And um, what, did you come first to Maida's poetry or to her fiction? I read her fiction first. I read her, I read Sirena Selena was the first book. Mm -hmm. I heard that I read, and then I read Cualquier Mercoles Soy Tuya. And um, I don't even remember exactly how I came across Boat People or when I came, it was years ago. Um, and, and it was, I mean, it was long before I thought about writing about it or translating it. And then I um, had decided at some point that I wanted to write more about migration and literature and remembered her book and, and went back to it mm -hmm. and then started translating little pieces of it. And, and every time I would go somewhere and talk about this work, talk about migration and literature and talk about um, these excerpts of, of Maida's po poems that I had translated, somebody in the audience would inevitably ask, where can I get yeah. that collection of poetry and I'd say it's not a, it's only available in Spanish mm -hmm. and so um, at some point um, when I was sharing my work 
I, I really was pushed by a couple of, of um, faculty members to, to complete the translation. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm happy I did. That's great. Um, and we also have a translation question here um, from Nancy Carlson. Um, she says, I think I heard you uh, say the word, word mulata. Was this a word choice you thought much about in terms of whether it would have the same intensity in English as it does in Spanish? That might, that I, question might open up onto into you know other other you know choices regarding other words that are very cult, you know culturally specific. You know. Yes, um, that's a great question. And mulata in particular and mulata are two words that I thought about a great deal. Um, and decided that they were best untranslated. Um, right. So similarly, Morenita and Morenita, I don't know if the selection, the, the poems that I read now used either of those terms, but, but um, I did think about them. And I, I think that I, in very early drafts, I had originally translated them and then um, none of the translations seemed appropriate because it seemed like they'd require an explanation. So mm -hmm. I went back to the Spanish and, and I also thought that retaining the Spanish was important because the collection in Spanish is quite multilingual. It has, it makes mm -hmm. references to other languages in the Caribbean mm -hmm. and the Caribbean is a very multilingual space. And I wanted to retain that in some way in the English. So I'm in the English translation. So I, I made the choice not to translate. It's something, it's something that we can do as translators from Spanish. Um, it's easier for us since we, we live in a country where Spanish is widely spoken and many, and many readers have if not total familiarity with the language, at least if enough familiarity that they can infer from context if we choose to um, to retain a term in Spanish, which you wouldn't be able to, to do, for instance, if you were translating from Romanian or Bulgarian or, or Japanese. Or Japanese or, right. Yeah. Less widely spoken, perhaps, mm -hmm. languages. But in, in the US, um, I think that's right. I think it would, it would, um, I think it would have changed the, the character of the poems quite a bit to try to translate all of those terms. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think we're at the end of our questions. Um, which, is there anything else you'd like to? I, no, I mean, I just, I, I'll just say that I, I really enjoyed um, uh, the translation, working on the translation, and um, I enjoyed working on it with with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a wonderful editor, and I I um, encourage people to check out the book. Go to your go to the Cardboard House Press website. There are lots of wonderful bilingual editions mm -hmm. there. Yeah, I also it very much encourage you to p pick up the book. It is a it is a short book. It's um, twenty one poems. Is that right? That's right, 20, 20 poems. 20, oh, just, just 20 poems. I was thinking, I'm oh, sorry, Neruda. Um, <laughs> there's the tw there are 20 poems and um, there is so much to chew over and think about in this very slim volume that I think really um, speaks to our times, like few things I've read rec recently. Yeah, I think that's true in, in that they really, um, they really do speak to these immigration crises that we're we're um, facing, right? Today. And it, you know, and from the from the from this very particular case of migration, this geographically specific location, the book kind of fans out into you know um, you know a, a work that that really resonates with so many other cases of migration around the world, and that is really that's something really powerful. I think that literature can do, you know. Yes can move from the particular to the universal in a really powerful way. That's right, yeah. Okay. Vanessa, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation thank and thanks to our audience for the questions. Thank you. And thank you to the festival organizers for, for inviting us. Absolutely. Happy San Jordi, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye.